Hey everybody, it's Andrew. And as always, I'm talking to awesome people. And this week, it is Greg Penny. Greg, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hello. <laughs> this is Thank really great. Uh, yeah, I have not seen you in a long time, and you've shaved since that picture. But I, we were just talking about how that picture was the first time I'd seen you in probably, I don't know, eight or ten years, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And I was very impressed with that beard. Well, you know, I, I loved it, but the hot weather made me surrender. It was yeah. just, it just got scratchy and yeah. I will rise to the occasion again though. Yeah. I love it. And you're, cause that's obviously not something you started off doing, <laughs> but uh... yeah, this is, this is the smaller of the two rooms in Ohio. And, and, um, as you can see, there's, uh, I use the Dyn audio in this room. I use the Dyn audio air six series. Right. Uh, I just, just added to my original five one setup. To Perfect. Yeah, because you've done did a lot of five one before Atmos. Yeah. So yeah, well, it's, I mean, well, we we can mention it now. I mean, because so you're making your second way through Elton's entire catalog, basically, right? Exactly. Yeah, chewing through it for a second time. But the good thing this time is, is that we got onto things that we didn't have before. Right. We found some things that had been um, misplaced shall I say, in the, in the shuffling of the multi-tracks during the years. Right. And, and then we um, we went through his archive because post the Blue Moves album, or from Blue Moves on, Elton owns all of his own masters. So right. things like, you know, I'm Still Standing, I guess that's what they call it, the blues, blue eyes, all that stuff are in his archive, but those actually had to be gotten out and dusted off and worked through and now I've been doing all those in Atmos and it really, uh, man, they're just amazing. They're amazing. That's incredible. They, they, I know he's a prolific major creator. Yeah. Incredible. Well, so we'll come back to him, but, but he actually features rather early, but I actually wanted to start with your parents. Sure. I want to go back a generation because, you know, there's only so much you can find on Wikipedia, but you can find some stuff. And both yeah. of your parents are absolutely fascinating. So <laughs> should we start with your, your mom, Sue Thompson, which was her, her yeah. stage name, right? Who yeah. is still in Vegas. She's going to be 95 yeah. next month, yeah. which is yeah. badass. But you just Talk a little bit about her, because it's, I mean, from what I saw, she she was Rosie the Riveter and then became a pop star, basically. Exactly. She she was uh, born to a, a working class family in Nevada, Missouri uh, in 1925. Came west literally in a, a Model A, crossed <laughs> the Mojave, Mojave Desert. There's a photograph of her somewhere sitting on the fender with her dad holding her sitting on the fender of the Model A. She was about 10 years old, I guess, maybe eight or 10 years old. And there's a big water bag on the side of the car, um, you know, to, to get them through the desert. And they moved to uh, first to just outside of San Jose, California. And he got a job picking peaches. Um, and they lived in a house that was built out of peach crates. Wow. You know, they, they, they were grapes of wrath stuff. And then, um, you know, she was, she was a dreamer and she was an only child. And I think that her, you know, her, she always wanted to sing and she had a little guitar, a little parlor guitar and she could play, you know, enough to accompany herself. And she would, she would, uh, she would sing. And then when she got into her teens, she got more serious about it and she got into talent contests and um, went to, up to San Francisco and got into a talent contest there. And when the, I know it sounds like she made this up, but she didn't. <laughs> her last name is McKee, but she always thought McKee was not a stage name. So when she entered the contest, this guy said to her, okay, you're up next. And what's your name? And she said, uh, and she literally, there was a payphone hanging and she opened the phone book and the first page said Thompson. And she thought to herself, well, Sue Thompson, that's it. Cause her first name is really Eva, Eva mm -hmm. Sue McKee. So she thought that was a little too home, hometown, homespun. So she said, my name is Sue Thompson. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sue Thompson. <laughs> and she won the talent contest. 
which got her uh, a spot as the lead singer on certain nights at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco with Dude Martin's orchestra. Wow. And then that started to cement her into that. And then her and Dude decided to move to LA in the early 50s. And she had cut this song. She was the first person to cut a very, an amazing song that I believe Patti Page had a hit with later, but a song called You Belong to Me, which is a beautiful song. See the pyramids along the Nile, watch the sunrise on the Tropic Isle. My mom was the first person to cover that song. And she had a hit with it, sort of a regional hit on the West Coast. And that then paved the way for them to go to LA together. Uh, and she, they did a lot of ballroom stuff and a lot of live shows. But she got this, um, her, her relationship with Jude Martin ended up, uh, they, they ended up being married after about a year. And it only lasted about a year. Um, but she, she and Dude um, befriended um, Spade Cooley, who you may be aware of. In the history of Western swing music, Spade Cooley was a very important fiddle playing, kind of Bob Wills guy, band leader. Right. And he had a television show um, that was a regional TV show at the time. And uh, so my mom went on the show as the lead singer on the show, the girl lead singer. And curiously enough, my dad, Hank Penny, who had already had a career for years, and I'll back up and run through a couple of his things in a second. They met on that show. My dad was a friend of, of um, you know, her, my mom's husband at the time. And uh, anyway, they, they were on the show together for a couple of years. And, and when my mother's relationship with Dude Martin fell apart, she and my dad got together. And I am the product of that relationship and I have an older sister who is the product of my mother's first marriage. Right. Who to one of her high school sweethearts in Lincoln, California. Wow. So my, my dad, uh, his, his trajectory towards that moment when they met was he's from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, very gifted young musician um, would do anything to get a gig. So, you know, he always encouraged me to do anything to get the gig. And one of the things that he did was to this guy asked him if he could play banjo. And he says, of course I play banjo. What are you, are you kidding me? So the only way he could get the gig was to run out to a hawk shop, hawk his guitar, get a banjo from the hawk <laughs> shop and tune it like the first four strings of a guitar so <laughs> that he could stand there and play along, you know, and look like a banjo player. So he, he progressed along and eventually he started a band called the radio cowboys and did local radio in Birmingham. And they eventually went up to WSM in Chicago. But my dad's fiddle player was um, um, Boodle O'Brien, who, if you know the lineage of Nashville hit making in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you'll know that Boodle and Felice Bryant, his wife, wrote all of the Everly Brothers hits. Right. They wrote they were the they were the machine behind that. Sound. I've heard stories of the Everly Brothers saying like, "Well, I'm singing the lead, right?" And they're in with one or the other of them, and both of them telling them, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you're singing the lead." And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Boudreaux Police, uh, you know, Boudreaux played fiddle with my dad's band, and then my dad eventually came to LA. And when he came to LA, he did everything from radio shows. He was a DJ to producing other people's records. And around the time that they did this, the Spade Cooley show, he had a business partner um, who, was not, I think his name was Tommy Thompson. He, they decided to open a nightclub and they found the Palomino Club and they could get the lease on it. So they got this club and they were, they were decided they were gonna make it sort of a showcase for Western swing music because my dad was friendly with the likes, everybody. I mean, my, that was my dad's, uh, circle of friends in LA were all the singing cowboys. Right. In, in, a, in a, to Spade and and Roy Rogers and you know um, all the all the you know Gene Autry and all all those people. He was also friendly with Bob Wills and a lot of the people who came from Oklahoma and Texas and you know that area. So their idea was to start a club and they they were trying to think of the name of it. And my dad had just bought a new shirt made by the Palomino Sports Shirt Company. So you have to look at the label and say, why don't we just call it the Palomino Club? That'll be great. We'll That's the brilliant. Of course. And, and so that was it. He started the Palomino Club and my mom and him 
they, they were on regional TV. And then when regional TV kind of phased out and national TV took over, a lot of people started looking around for other gigs. They were close with um, Louis Prima and Keeley Smith. So they realized that the Nevada circuit was something that was a breadwinner. You know, they could do what, what Louis and Keeley did and move to Nevada and work the Nevada circuit and still be available to get into LA. So we, uh, ah, uh, that's, that? that's mole. Hey mole. <laughs> yeah. And squids asleep on the couch back there. Oh yeah. Yeah. They'll probably fight in a minute. That's, that's oh, their cool. thing. Yeah. So they, they moved to Nevada and they bought it. They bought a house in Vegas. This is early, you know, this is Adam age Vegas. So this is when it was, I don't know, less than a hundred thousand people. It was small. Right. And the Cowboys and the mafia owned it and they stayed off all. Right. And the Cowboys and the mafia owned it and they stayed off of each other's toes. And then they bought a house in Carson city to go along with that. So they would do Vegas Tahoe and base in Carson city. And then we come back and do Vegas again and go to Reno and base in Carson city. So we had two houses and we would go between them and that lasted for a few years. They did pretty well. And then my mom, uh, in her second round of hit making came out with, um, she had been signed to Mercury and my dad had been too. And um, they, they decided to try to go with this new label that was based in Nashville. It was part of Aka Rose, the great music publishing company called Hickory Records. And Hickory had, you know, Hickory licensed the early Donovan records and Hickory right. had the new beats, bread and butter. And they, had, you know, it was largely the creative forces behind Hickory were the likes of Orbison and, Boudlon Felice and Don Gant and these people who were super cool and Wesley Rose ran the company. So um, she made a, a couple of records for Hickory and they came out of the box and were hits. She had a record called Sad Movies Always Make Me Cry, which was a big international hit and subsequently covered in a lot of places by like Sylvie Vartan um, in France. Um, and then she had a, a, a hit with a song called Norman, which was like a polka, an up-tempo polka. And another one called James Hold the Ladder Steady, which was a sort of a carbon copy of that. And all those were written by John Loudermilk. Right. And John also wrote Paper Tiger, which was her 1964, mm -hmm. 1965 hit. And this is, this is, she's already 40 years old. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say, I mean, she's peaking late and especially for the genre yeah. she's in, but it, it's yeah. amazing. And she's looking great, right? So she's on, she's doing Hullabaloo and she's doing Shindig and, you know, She's she's known all these guys forever. So like, you know, Leon Russell and Glenn Campbell and Delaney Bramlett and, you know, the Shin Dogs and all, all the people that were around in L.A. were friends of my mom's anyway from, right. you know, sessions there. And then the Nashville contingent folded into that. So it was not unusual for me to be hanging out with my mom and have Roger Miller and Glenn Campbell standing there and, and Ray Davies from the Kinks because my mom did – tours in Europe and toured with the kinks opening for them. Wow. 1965. So, so she had this beautiful cross section of people, you know, that she, yeah. that she interpollinated with. Um, and then, and then she segued, you know, towards the late sixties towards country stuff. Cause Hickory saw the, saw the, the potential in her crossing into country stuff. So she did duets albums with, uh, she did a duet album with Don Everly that was really good. She right. did a duet album with Don Gibson that was really good. And that put us in Nashville pretty frequently. You know, it was definitely the get off the plane, run through the songs. You got three days to make an album and you're out. You know, that was the way they did things. So right. it was cool to see. And that's what gave me the bug. So you were, you were there for all of that. Because where yeah. else were you going to be, right? Yeah, yeah, and and at Capital too. I mean, that's why when I go to work at Capital now, I have really early memories of that building because my both my folks worked there. Even though my dad worked more at United Western, right? My my mom worked at Capital a lot, and um, <laughs> I mean, it's just strange stuff. You know, all these people knew each other, so you yeah. know, Glenn on my mom's Coke commercials and. Uh, you know, uh, Roy Clark was a big artist on Capitol for a minute there. And Roy had been my dad's guitar player in his band. Right. So well, there was know. also something when I was reading about your dad. Well, there are two things. One was this song, Hillbilly Bebop, which yeah. is awesome. 
And when, if you hear it on its own, you think, well, you know, it's still kind of that Western tinged pop thing. But if you listen in context and where I found it was in a best of like a four year compilation of that label, the King label, and yeah. it sticks out like crazy. And then there was a story, and again, it's the internet, so who knows, but that there was a, a gig he actually got fired off, so he'd do anything to get the gig, but he refused yeah. to compromise his musicians wanting to improvise, and right. it's like, forget it, these guys improvise, and that's, so he, as much as it seems as though there's this very sort of, you know, it's a pop moving towards country, he was also pretty heavily influenced by the jazz scene, and you know, you think about when that was, you're talking late forties, early fifties. I mean, that's when bebop was really getting going. Yeah. And he wanted to stretch the form beyond, you know, the, beyond what Bob Wills had done with horns and steel guitars. My dad wanted it to be, I mean, he wanted a steel guitar to sound like, a, like a, you know, an improvis improvisational jazz instrument. You know, he was, he was into it, into stretching forms. Right. And he was also kind of, he was a little short tempered. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't suffer fools. So he would, you know, if, and, and the thing is, is that the, the work in those days was kind of straight laced. So if you were, if you were at all prone to be yeah. dangerous as a band, you know, he, he ran up against some situations that he probably regrets quitting or, you know, calling the golden nugget, the golden nookie right. or the sewer and getting <laughs> But you know, also, so and he wrote a song called Bloodshot Eyes, which seems to have tons of covers. And I was thinking, because yeah. I'm reading about the covers, and one of them was big in the Jamaican dance hall scene. Yeah. Pat Benatar did a version. And you think yeah. like, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be all over the map. But they're all exactly true to the original. Like yeah, exactly. the tempo is always the same. The groove is always the same. It's It's like the song that everybody wants to do, and they cannot change it. They absolutely right. can't change it. Even the one, so the Winoni Harris version of Bloodshot Eyes is the one that's that's that was the you know the big one. Yeah. And, um, and my dad was working for uh, Sid Nathan up from King Star Day, and actually Seymour Stein is hysterical because he's he's he worked for Sid too. So he Seymour tells me stories about my dad that are incredible, and he sings all my dad's songs to me whenever I see him. He's always you know. But but that period, my dad had a contract, but he somehow he got Sid to pay him under other pseudonames. <laughs> so he was knocking off tons of songs that I we haven't figured out where they all are. But Sid was paying him like fifty bucks a song or twenty five bucks a song, you know, just right. You know, this is your contract name, Hank Penny, and then you've got this. You, you, if you got a bunch of songs, let's just get them out there. So he'd show up at sessions and, and you know, instrumentals, rhythm right. blues tracks. And he was totally – it's weird because growing up with him, this gentleman from Birmingham, Alabama, who you could perceive as being kind of, you know, maybe a Confederate soul. It's weird. You know, it's, he used to tell me, take this record and go learn, learn about this band. It was James Brown. Right. You know, he was just like, you know – King Star Date, this is it, man. This is the stuff you should be listening to. Wow. So it was amazing. And Django and, you know, like great singers. I mean, he obviously adored great singers. Yeah. Um, but what a great education to sort of be there and watch some stuff happen, but to have someone feeding you everything else too. That's really yeah. great. Yeah. And, and and my mom had a lot of that same, you know, tendency to get out the 78s of Mildred Bailey and, you know, the people that I was unaware of that influenced, you know, this person influences that person, that person, that person. And this is what I listened to was the fifth generation. Right. She'd be taking back to the beginning. You know? And and my dad and Leo Fender were really close friends. So a lot of the time when I was really young, uh, there were just, it looked like a, um, you know, like a guitar parts warehouse or living room <laughs> at home. Like Leo would send him a guitar and say, stick this neck on that, broadcaster and see how it feels to you you know maybe does it set against you writer you know here's a here's a you know a, a weird shaped body that i don't have a name for yet and see how it sounds you know and <laughs> he ultimately settled on a jazz master with a with a custom neck that leo built right with a rosewood fretboard and i've got that guitar it's uh it's a beautiful guitar it's purple 
Wow. And, nice. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that stuff was really. You had a four track set up at home at some, so like how old are you when you decide, okay, I'm going to start doing this and what, how did you do it? And, Cause you're also moving around a lot too, which must've made that a little bit more difficult, but. Yeah, I was, uh, cause my folks split up when I was about six, I guess, uh, you know, and they were, they were friendly. So there was no, you know, there was no, I wasn't blocked from seeing my dad or anything like that. Right. But I grew up with my mom. And my sister, my older sister, Julie, um, had a, a huge influence over me. So she's the one that like taught me how to appreciate Motown and how to appreciate, you know, a lot of early 60s stuff. And she listened predominantly to, to Motown and to rhythm and blues records and soul records, you know, what I would call soul records at the time. And, and you know, so my exposure to, to those you know, she'd tell me who wrote the songs and stuff. And so that was a great influence. But um, progressing through that 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 time, um, I must have been about 12 or 13 when we, I went with my mom to Germany and the new thing at the moment was these Philips really cool cassette machines that had more gadgets that you could attach to them than your standard dictaphone. You know, they were kind of hi-fi and stereo and, you know, so my mom bought me one in this really cool electronic shop in Frankfurt. And, and I figured out ways of uh, using a second cassette and playing back and overdubbing into the first cassette. This is sort of the typical stories that you hear from, from folks at that time, you know, who were playing with the technology. And then um, I think I was 14 when I, I went to my mom and I said, listen, Sony has this really cool four track tape machine that uses professional sort of you know a record head and a play head and right and you can you can sync them and you can do overdubs and she's like well you know how what does it cost and so she and my brother-in-law co-signed for me to get uh, a sony four track quarter inch four track machine and i disappeared into it i didn't have a board i didn't have i had a mic pre and a couple of other little knobs that I could adjust volume and maybe some sort of primitive EQ, like a tap code mixer or something, you know, really, really very right. basic. And just started playing with, with, you know, what you could do with it and how you could. And were you, know, you always that. approaching it as a, as an engineer rather than it's a way to get your music out? So th you were always into the recording or this would start it off as a, I'm going to do what my parents do and write songs. And I kind of was just like, well, here, I've got this, I have this piece of gear. And there's nobody around who's writing or singing to record, so I'll just do it, you know? And it was just one of those things that's sort of, you know, that happens to us. So like, you did it just to have something to record, basically. Yeah, and then, you know, friends would say, well, God, I really like the sound of, you know, what you did on, on that thing when you did with a piano. Like, I detuned the piano and track it, like, three times so it'd sound, like, giant, you know? Right. Stuff like that. I'd do VSO tricks. And, and, you know, I have people that would call me and go, will you do a demo with me of a song? And this was in Vegas at the time. So I was living at my mom's house in a little uh, housing development about two miles off the strip. And it was a nice little house. And I had a den that was mine. And so my dad had bought me a, a Rogers Wildwood drum set, a double shell drum set, some really nice Zildjian cymbals. So I had this drum set and I had a little Wurlitzer spinet piano. And then I had a Wurlitzer electric piano. No, first I had a, I had a um, Honer electric piano, kind of right. like the sound on, you know, Revolution. Right? Yeah. And then I had, which is why I think I wanted it at that time. And then I had um, a couple of Fender guitars that my dad helped me get. And I had a Mose Wright acoustic guitar. And uh, I would just sit there all day long and make tracks. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, I started driving and I was coming into LA a lot and I was telling my mom, you know, I really want to work in LA. So I took a stab at getting into LA and right. get a job in the music business. She's like, well, go, you know, go see our LA and right. get a job in the music business. She's like, well, go, you know, go see our friends here. Or, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a relative that worked in the music business, but like Alan O'Day had been my mom's keyboard player he had just had the string of hits with undercover angel and all these songs that he had written for other artists and alan always looked after me and he was always like a big brother so and he had a sony machine too right. so he showed a lot of about how to use it and 
And then I tried to get gigs in the music business and it was, it was frustrating because nobody would hire me. I just said, you know, put me in the mail room. I don't care. I remember going to Capitol and sitting in this A&R guy's office and being really scared to death, you know, but thinking, I don't know why I'm scared. I know this business upside down. I, you know, I, I've been in this building for years and he said, well, you want to do it? I said, just, I don't, I don't care. I want to make records eventually, but give me a broom. I just want to be in this building. And he was like, come back when you really know what you want to do. So um, I was just so dejected. I was like, <laughs> I can't believe this. I thought they were going to say, dude, you're, you know, you're, you come from good stock, come to work, you know? And it, yeah. and it didn't, you know, and I couldn't get gigs. And, and I took day gigs, delivering flowers and like trying to stay, keep alive in LA. And I, and I had a hard time. So I crashed and burned, went back to Vegas to, to go lick my wounds and hang out with my mom for a little while. And then I really started recording more and learning more. And I just dove into all my gear. And then I moved back to LA and right away I got a job with Dinah Shore as a production assistant on Dinah's show. For those of you who are too young to remember Dinah, she was the Ellen DeGeneres of the time, but she was a big, been a big band singer. And so she had this afternoon um, hour and a half talk show. And we did, we did, we taped, uh, four shows a week, strangely enough, we worked four days, three days a week, but we taped four shows in those three days. So we, we could, on any given day, my job was to meet Jonathan Winters at his house and get all of his paintings. <laughs> and he's going to bring them down to the show and talk to Dinah about painting, how he likes to paint. And then when you're done with him, go meet Iggy Pop and David Bowie's with him and bring them to the set and make sure that they that, that nobody talks to David because David wants to just be seen as Iggy's piano player. And so that I did that, you know, <laughs> by the way, Tom, Tom Waits is coming in tonight, make sure he's gets to his room. And, and then, and then uh, Fred Astaire broke his wrist. So make sure when he comes in that you take it. So I'm, I met all these people. Amazing. It was insane. Now, or, but I used to see Orson Welles all the time. It was weird. I was really? like, really, yeah, I'd like go up to his house and he'd be floating. And he said, this is this is my most relaxing moment. He'd be laying in his pool in the backyard floating. And he <laughs> said, you know, when you get to my age and this weight, this is a magic moment when you can float. <laughs> when you get to my and age and this weight. <laughs> get my easel inside and my car. He was doing that magic thing that he was doing. He said, get my easel and my cards and these things. And I'm going to get a ride down the studio in a little while. You take that down to the set and set it up for me. And it was just like it was it was psychedelic. It was really weird. Wow. But but before all that, you actually met Elton John, right? So Yeah. So when did you meet him? Cuz that wasn't on the show. This was way before that, well, right? When I was in Vegas, uh when I was uh 15. So this would have been around 1971. So when he was touring I believe I'd land it right after Mad Men Across the Water came out, but before before Honky Chateau came out. Because right. Dave was actually playing with him uh, when I first met him. So um, to characterize me at that point, if anybody has, if any of you have seen Almost Famous, the the the, the kid in the film, the you know the yeah. main guy film is this young kid who can get you know he knows everybody can get him backstage his mom drops him at the gigs and says don't smoke dope and you know it's i was exactly that kid i was exactly that kid so in vegas i knew all the security guards i knew how to get into the gigs and sneak backstage so i i go along to see elton at the convention center and he was my favorite artist at the time he really replaced the beatles to me as 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 my new favorite artist and I remember going backstage to meet him and he was incredibly nice. He was like getting ready to leave the gig quickly because he had finished his gig and he was get, and he was dressing up. And I said, what, so where are you going? He said, I'm, I'm gonna go see Sammy Davis Jr. It's gonna be amazing. I love Sammy Davis Jr. So I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, this is this guy who's like co totally cognizant of Vegas and the whole Vegas vibe, you know, and the whole, you know, yeah. this guy's been on the road for years. He knows what he's doing. And the band were there and I met Nigel and Dee and Davey and, you know, and this and Stuart Epps and these guys that work for Elton and sound guys and stuff. Anyway, I was just sort of the young guy that, that came around. So I said um, to Elton, you know, my mom is Sue Thompson. He just stopped him cold. He was just like, are you kidding me? She's one of my favorite artists. 
So somehow over the next day, I get them together and introduce them. And he's just over the top and just wonderful to her. Wow. She loves him. It's all good. And this friendship starts and we get postcards from him from the road and we send him back notes. You know, we know he's in England and we send him a Christmas card and stuff. And this goes on for, you know, a few months. And, and then um, my mom and I go to Nashville because she's doing an episode of Hee Haw down there. <laughs> And it happened to coincide with the fact that the, he was there, you know, the band were there. So sure enough, we end up in the same hotel. She's like, well, let's call out and go do something. So we call him and he invites us to the show and she gets to see his show and he takes us to dinner and it's wonderful. And Larry Leg Smith from the Bonzo Dog Dudo Band was, was on the road with Elton doing a tap dance <laughs> shtick in the middle of I think I'm going to shoot myself, which was another weird thing at the time. That was really bizarre. But um, anyway, they're, they're friendly. This, this friendship ensues. And my mom's really comfortable with Alton in the scene around him. And he's, a, he's, he's a sweet guy. I mean, he's a great guy at that point, and super, but super fun. And uh, a few months later, um, he calls me. And I'm in Vegas. And he says, um, you know, what, what's, what are you doing? And he knew I wanted to be a producer. So he says, um, he says, I'm, I'm going to, I'm in Jamaica, but I'm going to go to LA for a few days. He said, everything blew up down here. I was trying to make this record and all blew up. This is just after Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. And uh, he said, I tried to, to work at this studio, Bob Marley, a tough gong, Bob Marley studio. And, he's, and it didn't come together. It was terrible. And I'm going to go to LA. So he gets to LA and um, one thing leads to another. And I end up meeting him and the band in LA and staying at the ho in my room at a hotel. And there. you're what, 17, 18? I'm not even 17 yet. I'm right. 16. God. And, and then he, yeah, may, no, maybe I just turned 17. And he says, you know, this David Ackles is there and Bernie's there and Bernie signed David Ackles to rocket records at that point. They, they were just getting rocket records started. So this was like a really magic moment, you know, and um, so, and I, and I meet all these people, I see all these people and they're all interested in what I like musically and they're asking me stuff. And um, so I get back to Vegas and, and they're like, my friends are like, where have you been for the last couple of days? And I'm like, well, I was in LA with Elton. And they're like, yeah, sure, dude. Cause Elton's <laughs> blown up at this point. Like yeah. he's, he's freaking huge. So um, that's put me in an awkward position with, with friends cause they never believed me um, until I showed them pictures and stuff. But um then he calls me a few weeks later and he says, okay, we're going back into the Chateau. And my mom had encouraged me to go to school in Europe. So I wanted to go to an electronic music school because that's how silly I was. I was thinking you go and you learn about synths, you know? Right. I was really CD at the time. I was really into, you know, like I was really into the Wendy Carlos records and all of the, you know, switched on Bach, all the stuff that, you know, was synth oriented. I thought was really cool. So. I was going to go to Europe and I found this electronic music school in, in Geneva. And I said, Elton, look, I'm coming to Europe. It, would it be possible for me to see you there? And he said, why don't you just come to the sessions that we're doing? And I said, okay, great. So I, I launch out and we, for some reason or another, Geneva just went out the window and it was just me going to France. So I flew to Paris. His driver picks me up at the airport, John, really nice guy, takes me to the Chateau where they're recording Yellow Brick Road. And I spent the next 10 days watching them record Yellow Brick Road. Wow. So, so I was there when he sang Kennel in the Wind. I was there when I remember pulling in the driveway and hearing this rock and track going because the way that place was constructed, it was Michel Manier's personal little, yeah. you know, Heap that he bought in the French countryside. So there were like fields full of sheep and, you know, little country roads and lanes. And then there was this chateau that was a farm and there was like, you know, broken down tractors and stuff. And then this gravel driveway and this big master house that they had put the studio on the second floor. So it had those European push out windows that wrote that pivot, you know. And the windows were open and there's this rock and track playing and they keep stopping it. And I can hear a voice say, no, no, give it to me one more time. And it's D, and he's playing the bass line. He said, and that's a right for fighting. Yeah. Right? And that's the first time I ever heard that track. So he's doing patchwork work, right? 
And, uh, you know, everybody's busy. So I kind of find my little room that they assign me to and, and, uh, and I get set up. And then um, in the evening, Elton says, so let's do a playback for Greg. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> okay, great. How many tracks do you guys record? And he says, I don't know, what are we, 20, 21? I'm like, holy crap, that's a big record. And he said, yeah, yeah, you got to hear it. It's really good. So it's David Henschel, wonderful, very sweet man who let me, you know, be in the room and treated me really cool. Gus Dudgeon, who was super cool, let me be a fly on the wall and ask stupid questions, stupid questions. It's a little MCI desk, Adobe A rack, an MCI, you know, the accompanying MCI 16 yeah. machine. Um, kind of a groovy 70s French room with sort of like beanbag chairs and stuff, you know, where you'd want to hang out. And, Nigel D. Davey and a couple of other guys um, who were there, the roadies that were helping them. You know, they had come down from London with a van full of gear and stuff. And he proceeds to start at the top and play me the entire Yellow Brick Road album in the running order of the album. But I'm watching Dave. I'm sitting fairly close to Dave and I'm watching him. You know, he's got the tape running and he's moving faders like this. And I'm thinking, God, this is a long, you know, this is, it's, it's a track, but he hasn't dropped the lead vocal in yet. He's just going to get the balance and then go back and, you know, drop the lead vocal. In. He never does. And I realize it's an instrumental. And then it goes in, you know, from funeral for, yeah. from, it, didn't have the, it didn't have Dave's synth part on the front yet. He was conceptualizing it at that point. Oh, right. So it's pretty he sparse then. It. Yeah. He tacked it on when he got back to London. So, you know, it's the whole pomp and circumstance sort of funeral for a friend thing. And then it goes into Love Lies Bleeding and, you know, Elton's vocal is freaking amazing and I'm in the room and I'm listening. And of course, I'm melting, completely melting down. I can't believe it. It's so unreal that, I, that I'm just like completely. But they hadn't done the backgrounds yet. So he's sitting next to me singing all the harmony. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And then at the end of it, it was like, he knows I'm the, you know, I'm, he knows to this day I'm the biggest fan that he has, but I also know what he's capable of because I've been there and I've seen it. Right. So he, he's like, so what do you think? And I, I was like, I can't, I can't even tell you. I mean, it's just so, I wrote all the song titles down that I could get from him that some, some I had wrong. And I remember writing a note to my girlfriend in Vegas and I was going to mail it. And I said, you know, tonight I'll play his album. Blah, blah, blah. And I ended up not mailing it. I kept the note and I read it recently. And it's really just like the, observations of this wide-eyed 17 year old boy in france with all these you know there's the gay contingent and there's the straight contingent and there's the groupies and there's the whole thing and i'm watching this going this is it yeah this is this is you know anyway it was great to watch the guys do their vocal stuff their background vocal stuff and to um i had a camera with me so and it's a good thing because nobody else was taking pictures and now whenever we want to chronicle you know when they yeah. go back to that stuff i've got all the pictures i took wow. all the, yeah they just used one for a postage stamp in the uk it's a shot of elton singing candle in the wind oh yeah yeah wow with like a few with like a fiorucci t-shirt on which I was, we went shopping one day in Paris and he bought that in, in Saint Germain. <laughs> so there was a, there was a long, I mean, this guy was like my big brother. He understood that I didn't get a lot of the, you know, the, and, he, and then him and Reed were, John Reed were a couple at that time and they were really kind of protective of me. And they were like, you know, they, there was some, there was, I, I had no desire to get into the gay scene. But there were, you know, there was a lot of guys around and and they were all really cool with me. And I made a girlfriend, you know, I met a girl in London, another girl. And I had a little relationship going with this girl in London. And so I, I went back to England with Elton and John at the end of the album. And I stayed in Virginia Water for six weeks. Wow. And I would go into London every day. And occasionally if he was going into Rocket, because they had, they, Gus was at Trident mixing the album. Right. And... And Ray Cooper was putting all the percussion on and Del Newman was doing the strings and everything. I'd go in and I'd ride in with him and then I'd go off and toddle through Soho and do my thing. And then I'd meet him back for a ride home or I'd take the train back to Virginia Water in the evening. He lived in near Weybridge, you know, out Surrey. Right. 
I got lost one night and had to go to a call box and call the house. And John came and picked me up. John Reed came and picked me up, who I'm still, I really like Reed. He's a, he's a great guy. I really like John. I'm not in touch with him that much, but, but I am in touch, you know, with continually with Elton. I mean, but what a, I mean, you know, if that's not going to cement that that's what you want to do. And yeah. then of course, this is before the trip to LA where you're desperate to just work in the mailroom. Yeah, exactly. And then get exactly. completely shut down. Yeah. And I go to work at, I go to work at Target or not Target, but I um, can't remember what it was called at the time, but it was like a big box store where you, it was like Pier One, this place called, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I needed a day gig. So I went to work there as a stock guy and I thought, well, this is, you know, it's low profile. I can still make a few bucks an hour and and keep myself alive in Hollywood at that point because I didn't really have a way forward other than that. And uh, my folks never made much money. I mean, you know, through all these years and all these groovy things they did, they couldn't really, la you know, they couldn't afford to lavish me with a pad in LA and stuff. So, so I was on my own. So I remember there was a defining moment, you know, in the back of the warehouse, they'd play like KLOS and they're banging the hits, you know, playing it's ELO and, you know, I guess it's at that point, who, whatever was big at that moment. So this is like mid seventies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Saturday night's right for fighting comes on, you know, and it's playing. And the, the, there was a guy that worked with me and I'm like, I was there when they recorded this track. And he's like, fuck you, man. No way. <laughs> I love I that no one ever believes you ever. <laughs> yeah. I remember thinking, I can't do this anymore. I got to go be in. You know, I got to really stick it out and be in my business. So that's that's kind of when I when I went to work for Dinah, there was an acknowledgement that I that I knew the industry. And so I did that. And then I went to work for once again, Alan O'Day's influence. He was a writer for Warner Brothers Music and he steered me towards them because there was an opening in the mailroom. there. And we were up on Sunset at 9200 Sunset and I went to work in the mailroom pulling acetates that's how old school it was pulling acetates for people and pitching like, Oh, actually setting up the professional managers to pitch to people. Cause I wasn't the pitcher yet, but within a couple of months, they gave me an office and an assistant and I was a song plugger for Warner music. Right. And we, you know, at that time we had, uh, you know, uh, we had Webster music, you know, Guy Webster's dad and his big catalog. And we had with the Spider-Man theme and all that stuff. And then we had all of Alan Toussaint stuff. So it was great pitching the Alan Toussaint things and, um, the Gershwins, you know, and Ira was still alive. So it'd be like, you know, the, there were some of the guys in the company would hang out with Ira because he liked to get visitations from the publishers occasionally. Right. We knew he loved chocolate. So they were taking chocolate. So there were, there was all this stuff happening. And because it was Warner music, you know, Amit would come by and Arif would come by and it was, it was a vibey place. So I quickly made friends with Rob Dickens who ran, and you probably know Rob. Rob ran no, I don't Warner know, actually. Rob ran Warner Music UK, the publishing company. But he was also on a, in an upward trajectory, and he became literally the Warner Music head for all of Europe, based in in England, and was extremely powerful and signed the likes of Inya and you know Rod Stewart and all, all these things. But at that time, he was running Warner Music, and he was just coming up, and he said, you know, these these guys don't really appreciate you around here. Do you want to come to work for me? And I was married at the time to a girl named Melanie, who I don't know if you ever met Melanie. Mm -hmm. She worked with fire. So um, he said, I can get Seymour to bring you and Melanie to London and she'll work for Seymour in London at Sire. And then we have this joint business called Corova and I've signed this band called Echo and the Bunnymen and I can't do all the work every day. So what I want you to do is look after Corova. So suddenly we're just picked out of Warner Music in LA and shipped off to London. And I went to work in Berners Street in Soho in the Warner Music offices uh, and shared a space with Atlantic Records with um, Phil from Atlantic. And um, and I took care of the day-to-day -day activities of Corova, which was amazing. We had wow. Echo and the Bunny and you know, some of the some of the Liverpool kids that came down and were in deaf school, you know, original mirrors, um, big in Japan, um, teardrop explodes. Um, I signed a guy named Mr. Burns. That's where I met Thomas Dolby and, and, and was just in awe of him and desperately wanted to sign him and unfortunately missed out on that. You know, I, I, right. 
Rob said, do what you want to do. He's really good. And I offered him a deal and somebody else, I think Virgin had offered him a better publishing deal at the time, but I've remained friends with him for all that time. So it was a hotbed of cool stuff, you know, Yeah. Ghost Drummer was around all the time and the guys from Madness and I, you know, I got to be friends with Suggsy and Betty, and, you know, just all those people were there. So it was a really cool moment. This is 1980 in London. Yeah. That's well, amazing. That for about a year and a half and, you know, I met Simon Townsend and he had Pete's little brother and he had a band called On The Air. Yeah. With, it was him and the two guys from Big Country, you know, and I did a bunch. Of, I produced, you know, I did a bunch of stuff with them. And so I was able to get my name around as a producer. And then after John Lennon, actually the day after John Lennon was killed, I, I was so completely crushed by that happening. And I realized that I wasn't exactly doing what I wanted to do. I was working, I knew I was in and amongst great people, but I knew that on my own, I was not going to rise to where I wanted to be as a producer. Right. If I didn't make a, a kind of a radical move. So I had a long talk with Rob and he was, he was initially bummed because I, I, I helped him a lot there, but he said, you know, do your, I encourage you to do your thing. And I said, I, well, I can't live here because, um, I can't live here because I can't afford it. Right. There's no public system that allows me to collect unemployment or something here. So I got to move back to LA. So I moved back to LA and that's when I really started digging into my Warner ties and, um, and Westlake on Beverly. Yeah. And, you know, I was luckily, luckily, lucky enough to get time there. Oh, and when I was at Warner music, I'm trying to rip through things really quick. So yeah, yeah, so, but it, I mean, it's all about it's, the, the it's journey. It's a mismatch of stuff. It's really weird and genres and everything. I had made friends with George Giorgio Moroder via his assistant, Lori, prior to going to England by pitching him songs for all kinds of different projects that his production company were doing at Musicland and in LA. And in doing that, I met Keith Forsey. And I was really comfortable with... Giorgio and Keith, you know, and I could go to meetings with him and stuff. So while I was in London, Giorgio came through a couple of times and he said, why don't you just come to work for me? Why don't you leave Warner and come to work for me and you'll be my publishing guy. And I said, I, I don't think I'm skilled enough as a publisher to like walk into rooms and make the deals you want to make. But I know Rob will let me give you a million dollars. He said, what? And I said, yeah, let me sign you to Warner. We'll just be your administrators. And there'll be a, you know, you'll get a big upfront. And then I'm still there. I'm doing your thing. You're, you know, and we can key man it or whatever you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I to Warner Music. <laughs> Rob, get, Rob let me give him a million bucks because we knew it was out there. Yeah. Yeah. And then I came back to LA. And when I was broke and I was collecting unemployment, trying, trying to get started again and working at uh, Westlake on Beverly, um, the, uh, the, the team that ran, Westlake, you know, knew that I knew Giorgio and I'd run into him there. And so they gave, they started giving me time. And so I worked between Giorgio's house on Carlo Ridge, up in on Carlo Ridge on things, remix, like I remixed the Bowie version of Cat People for a bunch of different releases. So I did stuff, you know, it was, and that was one of my first experiences working with somebody that was as awesome as Giorgio, right? Who's I don't know if you've worked with him, but he's... No, no, but I've seen videos and things, and it's just yeah. amazing. And, of course, that went by the wayside until I was with, hanging out with my kids as kid, friends, you know, a couple of years ago, and they're, like, playing the Random Access Memory album, you know, and, <laughs> and it gets to, to the Giorgio song. And I say, yeah, I love this. He just he's, he's just the way he's always been. And they're like, oh, you don't know, George. you know, they're like, I love, again, nobody believes you <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. You don't know George ever. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, so, so I started working with him and we wrote a bunch of songs. Keith and I wrote a bunch of songs together and that was right when he started doing the Billy Idol stuff. So that little thing was blowing up. Right. And, um, and that helped me in getting time. So then I'd go out to Warner and um, I had, you know, artists that I'd find and I'd try to do some demos with them and play them for the guys at Warner and nothing really stuck, but they liked what I was doing. And that's when um, one day they said, um, 
there's this band that Seymour signed to Sire, and it's actually this actor named Bill Paxton's band called Martini Ranch. And they got this weird video with Rick, that Rick Rossovich is in, and you should watch it. So um, I watched it, and I said, I'm in. Just you know, tell me what to do. And they said, well, well, they gave me this tiny, tiny budget to make this album. And I met all the guys, and I really liked them. And so we put the whole album together in Andrew Todd's apartment in Ocean Park. Every day, I'd go down there with my sequencer, and we'd like sequence the whole album. So it was all in a sequencer. And then we dumped it at a little studio in Studio City. We dumped a Tantalock tape. And uh, Bill came along, did vocals, and Judge Reinhold was, you know, he brought in all of his actor friends and his best friend at the time was Jim Cameron. And so <laughs> it was obvious that Jim was gonna make the videos for the records. So Jim made this video of Reach and he shot it. And then he called me and he said, you know, I got lots of footage for this track and he said, I know how MTV works, man. He said, you're, you're right at like four minutes and two seconds, or you're right under four minutes, something like that for, for radio. Right. I said, yeah, I mean, that was, that's, we calculated that. And he's like, why do we want to do that one? I can, I can get a seven minutes on MTV. Can you cut, can you recut the track and I'll recut the video and then you guys get like more screen time. So I sat with Jim and I did all the edits to cut this record into this long thing. And then he recut the video. And if you ever get a chance to see it, it's really funny because Catherine, um, Jim's ex-wife at the time, but Catherine who did uh, Hurt Locker. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's in it. Judge Reinhold's in it. All these, you know, you look through it and there's all these faces. Bud Court's in it. You know, it's wow. it. And all those people were on the album. And then that got me... Um, Mark Anthony Thompson's second album. Mark and I were friends and he had a bunker in Hollywood. And Mark, as you know, has progressed to be known as Chocolate Genius and he, and he, he moved from LA to the East Coast for a while. And I'm not sure where he is now, but I loved working with him. It was, it was, a, that was a fun album to make. I made that for reprise. And that was what got me KD. They were like, we have this artist that Seymour that we didn't want to sign to Warner country in Nashville. We wanted to kind of keep her separate because she's real strange. And she thinks, you know, she, her performance piece is that she's the reincarnation of Patsy Klein. And I was like, wow, I'm all over that. <laughs> and so they, they said, well, yeah, we know. And we know from the family you come from that you'll understand what she really wants to achieve. So they got me on the phone with her. And the first thing she said was, um, first thing I need to know is, are you a vegetarian? And I said, absolutely. She said, all right, come up to Canada and see me. So I went to see her at the Calgary Olympics. And was this like your dad playing banjo? Like you were eating a cheeseburger while you said it? <laughs> <laughs> I should have been, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I knew I, I knew I vibe with her and I get off the plane and in Calgary and she does this whole, I mean, I went right to the arena and she's doing the Olympic closing song. And then there was this sort of, you know, adrenaline with the band and stuff afterwards it was a big deal. And I, and I, you know, I'd never been to Calgary before, so I didn't really understand it. But uh, the next day her and Ben Mink uh, and I got together and um, she said, let's go eat Indian food together. And we're in the Indian restaurant and she's in the, in this, you know, it's, they're playing Indian tunes on the, on the thing. And she says, this is what I want my next album to sound like. And I said, no problem. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can do tamburas and steel guitars. And she's like, yeah, let's do that. So that's when we started rolling up to what we did after that. And she had done Shadowlands. So she had to have that. She, she had to wait for that to come out. Right. And for it to go through its whole cycle and her touring and stuff. And that she wanted to kind of, in a way, I think she wanted to do that and then make sure that she quickly got away from that. She didn't want to be pegged as a natural artist. Right. So, so that's when we started um, what became Absolute Torch and Twang and that we were adamant about keeping a door open to more Eastern influence. I mean, her phrase at that time was, yeah, I'm country, but I don't know what country I am. Right. Well, now, is this... So was that before Ricky Lee Jones or was Ricky Lee Jones sort of in the interim while she's touring that record or where does that fit in? Ricky, this was before working with Ricky. I did. So, so one of my close friends in LA, two of my close friends who were married at the time were 
uh, Carol Parks and Dean Parks. And Carol had produced, uh, oh my God. She had produced a bunch of records and been a, a session singer and a songwriter in LA for years. And Dean Parks, of course, That's legendary cool. guitarist. You've worked with Dean yeah. a million times. So uh, Dean, uh, so I went up to Canada to do Absolute Torch and Twang. And at the end of the record, I get a call from Carol and she says, listen, um, Dean's been having conversations with Walter. And of course I knew it was Walter Becker. And, and I said, yeah. And she says, well, Ricky's band, Ricky's in the studio. And I didn't know Ricky yet. Ricky's in the studio and Walter's producing her new album for Geffen, but she's banned him from the control room and she fired Roger Nichols from the record. <laughs> so i'm like which okay. is pretty bold at yeah. that time especially yeah yeah you you basically cut off two of the people who you have to work with so dean said so i got this idea that you could be the intermediary and ricky's up for it so i, I went back to la and they said let's let's do a dinner with you and ricky and and walter and just introduce you guys so she would and eat said, dinner with him. He just wasn't allowed in the control room. Right. Yeah, she would. Eat, exactly. Because she, she didn't. She didn't. She was. First of all, it stemmed from her being completely intimidated by Walter. She was a huge Sealy Dan fan. And, you know, and, and a lot of Ricky's genius is that she works stuff out in the studio, you know, and they can it can it can sound very weird for a long time. And then all of a sudden it gels. and It's just like magic. Right. Right. It's just incredible. And she didn't want to do so, that in front of him. No. So that she's like, you have to sit out there. And so he'd sit in the, in the lobby. Well, at 55, you probably saw him. He'd be sitting there in the, in the TV with the TV on Tenement Square. I remember that at the time we were watching the things in China. And he'd be sitting out there just shredding, you know, <laughs> incredible, but not in the control room. And then she'd leave and we'd go through the debrief and I'd tell him what we'd done. But so we go to dinner and I'm like, can I bring KD? And they said, sure. So KD and Walter and Ricky and I go to dinner. And Katie's all over Ricky because she just is a huge fan. Ricky doesn't really know Katie yet, but she's aware that she exists. Right. And it was this nice conversation. And literally it was like, okay, so you, you need to come in and make sure this record gets made. Um, Gary Gersh has been really cool. He's the A&R guy on the record. I'm like, I've known Gary for years. So I'm like, okay, so um, what do you want me to do? And they're like, well, you're going to engineer it, but you're also going to just be there for Ricky, whatever she needs. And then you're there for Walter, whatever he needs. And so I thought, okay, that'll be cool. I'll be locked in a room with Ricky and Walter for six months. And somehow I'll just absorb so many cool things that it'll be amazing. So that's what I did. And we went to work at Studio 55. And it was partially on my recommendation because I love that building. You know, I love that and the history there. Yeah. And then we did these sessions first day in with JR and Greg Fillingaines and Neil Steubenhaus. And, you know, it was an amazing band on the floor and her singing live. And the, the outcome was just really great. I mean, it just felt really groovy. So I stayed on for like six months and Roger came back for a minute at the end and had a, had a showdown with Ricky and left again. And then I ended up at village mixing and, and it was not under the circumstances that I would have normally done things. And I felt a little bit like a fish out of water. I mean, I, I, I didn't really know how to use the knee and I was a little bit like, I'm not sure I can do this. And Walter was really adamant that it was like, you know, do all your moves in the computer on the desk and then make sure you dump it to 96 K digital, which at that time was like, really, that's difficult. You know, yeah. And don't compress it and make sure that you don't over, you know, that you don't overload the machine. That's why the album, which became flying Cowboys is so damn quiet still because yeah. if you mastered it, uh, you know, Chris Bellman mastered it. It's um, there's no level on that album. And it's really a good record, you know? Yeah. And oh, it's a great we, record. And it sounds yeah. really good, but yes, it is very quiet. Yeah. So that, that happened. And then, um, hang on, just one second. Yeah. Hey, I'm on, I'm on my own. I'll call you Smith. Um, so that, that happened. And then, and then I went and did, um, probably the Sun 60 record. Yeah, well, that would have been, yeah, because the Sun 60 record was 90. I think it came out in 90. It took forever so, to come out. So, so it, it would have been, been before, a little bit before Sun 60. Yeah. There was, 
um, there was a period where we delivered Flying Cowboys and then um, I was getting ready to go to Vancouver to do another record with Katie, but she was not sure what she wanted to do. And so right pre Sun 60, which is where you and I got to spend a bunch of time together. Yeah. Was um, KD coming to Ojai to find a direction for, for a clear direction for what became Ingenue. And she was beside herself. She just, we had done this track, this track for um, what's it called Red Hot, one of the Red Hot series of albums. Right. The whole Porter tracks. And we had done So in Love. And we'd done it in Vancouver quickly. And it was amazing the way it came out. And that gave us an indication of stylistically where we wanted to go. And it was really received well. So she came to Ojai and stayed with us for about, I don't know, 10 days. And her and I just went in my garage and started writing and listening to stuff. So I, I had just come back from England and I was, you know, I had gone out and hung out with youth and Talvin Singh and, I had these cool records and I was playing her this stuff and trying to get her into things, you know? And that's when she decided that it'd be good to have more Eastern influence on Ingenue. And, and we started writing by, and she loves to detune guitar. So we'd play with tunings and stuff. And, and um, we wrote this song, So It Shall Be. And that really kind of cemented an idea for her what she could continue with. Right. And that was all it was. It was just me trying to figure out a way to get her to feel good about writing again. So she, we played it for Lenny, uh, who was always there for Katie at Warner and Roberta, who recently passed away. Roberta recently passed away. And they were like, yeah, that's your album. You got to do that, something like that. So uh, she went back immediately to Vancouver and started writing with Ben Mink. And yeah. they came up with the balance of the Ingenue album. And then I went up. And then the last thing she threw in, which was a little awkward, was she was like, let's make this a live album and let's make it kind of jazzy. And she's like, how, are, how much are you into the hissing of summer lawns? And I said, I know it upside down. I mean, it's, you know, John Garren. She's like, yeah, John Garren, right? Get John Garren to play drums on this record. So I was like, great, fantastic. We're going to make a Johnny Mitchell record. So, so... <laughs> I get John, I'm up there, we're in the studio and do you know John? No, no, I don't. Oh, at the time there was sort of a, an instant clash because KD is, is, you know, she's of a certain, I, 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 how do I describe it? You know, she's, she doesn't have to be feminist. I mean, she is this energy that is yeah. both feminine, feminine and extremely knows about her feelings and you know her stuff and, and john is like he's just kind of a cat you know he's a cool guy and he came in and we're like starting to run things down and it's feeling good and he's taking a little shot of whiskey here and there and and he's and he starts calling her babe on oh, the boy. yeah oh, and boy. It, i would say that he was i would have done it maybe too i don't know but, but at the moment it hit her wrong and then she couldn't get into singing against what they were doing. So she said, I, 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 I feel really uncomfortable with this. I'm not sure what to do. And I said, that's okay. I'll take care of it. So, you know, I take the giant mom to dinner and I'm like, I wish it had worked out and you'll still get paid. And <laughs> this is, so he goes and we're left in this at Vancouver studios with me and Ben and Katie in a room with Mark. Romare, uh, and how are we going to start this record? We don't have a drummer. We don't have any. We got Dave Pilch, who's in Toronto, and we'll get him to play bass eventually, but not on the not when the tracks are going down. So Ben's just like, you know, just start putting some beatbox things together, and I'll just I'll just make it feel right. One little parlor Washburn acoustic guitar. We start the album, and it's unbelievably magical. And Katie starts putting these really cool overdubs on it, and that was where we knew. All right, this is the this is the dope. And Ben's like, I got the string parts. Make a slave, and then I'll do like twenty tracks of strings on this on this tune. But he played them all himself, right? Viol violin and viola, and then we had a guy come in and do some cello like support notes. And that album suddenly had this insane vibe, you know. It is 
It is a fantastic record. I mean, we should, for the people watching this, if you don't know this album, we've talked about a thousand great records already, but you've got to go listen to this record start to finish. You, you have to, I mean, Save Me, the, the opening track is still one of my favorite things. And I'd forgotten about it. You know, I haven't listened to the record in a long time. Yeah. And I put that track on today thinking, well, I'm just going to be skipping through because I wanted to listen to a bunch of stuff. And I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop it. And it sounds like it could have come out yesterday or 60 years ago. But it's it's also, I think to me, what was amazing was the, like you say, there's the Eastern influence, but it's not at all, like if you say that and people haven't heard the record, they think like, oh, cool, there's going to be some sitar on it. Like, <laughs> it's not that at all. I mean, it's it's almost like, like Greg Lees plays his, some of the slides I and mean, he is an absolute genius I always describe it as like he's the guy who played all the notes you forgot to play that make right. your song amazing but yeah. even his style is slightly different like he, oh, yeah. he has more sort of set melody parts and it's not just the atmosphere and the background and it's a really magical record but I, I wanted to ask you about one track on there yeah um, still thrives this love yeah because I mean, I as soon as it starts, like, okay, I re remember this perfectly because I've heard it 5,000 times, but it's been 10 years or something like that. But I'd forgotten how kind of like Jobim that track is. Oh, yeah. And yeah. like, w was any of this sort of a conscious decision? Like, okay, this track is going to be like this? Or is it just like you start, you set up the Foxtrot beat and away it goes and... That's what it was, exactly. Or like, you know, that thing... Uh... Yeah, or that's how Constant Craving came about. I mean, Katie wanted that to sound like a Kurt Vile track, like, you know, like something from Ten, Ten Penny Opera, Three Penny Opera. Right. She wanted, she was really influenced by German, you know, Kurt Vile stuff, right? And she was listening to, um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So she wanted it to be sort of an accordion and a loose, you know, sort of a not heavily percussive track. And so, but, but, you know, what it became was almost like a Motown drum part under this Kurt Vile track. And, and, and then those guitars were all that whole thing. That whole album was self-driven and it was out of complete desperation sometimes that the style would, would morph into what it became. Right. Almost through that record, like Greg, Greg playing that opening. Doo, doo, doo. He played it on a Rickenbacker frying pan lap steel sitting next to me in the control room and then we made that whole album at the desk everybody that had an electric instrument sat next to me at the desk katie even did her vocals on a, i had a boom arm over the desk so she could like ride her back all those freaking amazing background yeah. vocals you could set her own levels and go i need a little more of the low note here and she we, we sat together and did it that way and and anyway so and she we, we sat together and did it that way and and Anyway, so um, as it progressed, it it took shapes of its own. You know, season of hollow soul was was she was like, I want the chorus to feel like ABBA. So you know, we did all the whole sort of Benny grand piano, da 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 da. -da you know that yeah. kind of stuff. Like that. <laughs> um, we did the big vocals and you know and stacked it so it would sound like like the girls. Um, Constant craving. I knew that if we could get some rhythm under it, it would work. Katie detested that track. <laughs> and as we progressed work on it, she more and more became disassociated from the sound of it. But we only had 10 songs. And she she was adamant that she was going to deliver what they wanted, which was a 10-song record. Right. And so through all the stuff that you go through to get a record made, you know, she has to leave and run, go into a film in Germany for three weeks and gets a, an abscess tooth and comes back and can't hear pitch and she's struggling with it and feels terrible about herself. She thinks she's lost her voice. And we explained to her that it's, it's a, it's a dental thing. If you get this thing done, you get a root canal, you come in three days and you'll, everything will be perfect, which is what happened on our show. She ended up singing the whole album at the very end. Right. We hated constant craving so much. I mean, we can laugh about this, you know, and Ben's a genius. He figured out how to, how to work around it, but, that she refused to sing the third verse up there in Vancouver. And we had already booked into Skip Sailor's room on Larchmont in LA to mix it. 
And of course we arrive there and NWA are in the back room. <laughs> so that was, that was <laughs> pretty weird. similar artists, so, you know, I've got EP and, you know, and Dre, you know, <laughs> cro crossing in the halls, hanging out together. Um, so, we, so she's still got to sing this third verse of this track and really buff out the choruses and stuff. So, they split for a day and I take over their room, which is in the back at Skip Sales. Do you remember that room in the yeah. back? It was, yeah. So, so I'm back there with her. She's singing, not into it, but she's going to be a pro and get through it. And she's got her little dog with her and little dogs on the floor. And it's just me and her. And, and Ben is in the front with Mark pushing through the mixes, right? Because we got to get through all those mixes in the, in the SSL room. So I'm like, you ready? And she's, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm like, you know, record and I'm, I'm sitting and listening and she's like trying to get this feel and this lyric that she's written for the third verse and she can't get it. She's like, hang on a minute. And I can hear the pencil. You know, Let's try this. And you know, I give it to her again. And, you know, she's not quite there and we stop and I hear her go, fuck. I just fucking hate this. You know, she's, <laughs> she's like, yeah, I can hear her talk real quietly in the distance. And I have no sight line to her. So Eventually, it gets super quiet. And I'm like, you ready to go again? And I don't hear anything. And I'm like, I look. And the headphones are hanging on the, on the mic stand. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? So I get up and I go out. She's not there. I go outside. She's not there. I figure, okay, she's fed up. She doesn't have to tell me. I go into the mix room. I'm like, she's probably listening to the mixes. I go in and Mark and Ben are having lunch. And I'm like, where's Katie? And they're like, I don't know. She's been with you. <laughs> I'm like, Skip, have you seen Katie? And he's like, oh, yeah, she barreled out of here in her car with her little dog about 10 minutes ago. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? The phone rings. And I'm like, where are you? She says, I'm home and I'm not coming back. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, I want you to take that fucking song off the record. I hate it. And <laughs> so, I, so I'm like, Ben, what are we going to do? And he's like, guitar solo. <laughs> and we bought this guitar, this, this national guitar this little black national guitar in a, in a reggae record store in Vancouver. And it was the only, we were proud. It was the only electric guitar on the Ingenue album. We had no elaborate setup, except for Greg's stuff, except yeah. for his steel. We had no elaborate setup. So all the electric, like Kig Creole and the coconut guitar lines on Miss Chatelaine, that's yeah. all been this, this, this really funky hundred dollar national guitar. So we take it out in the, booth you know in the room where i was working on our vocals ben plugs it we plug it straight into the board he takes a wire pair of wire cutters snips off the end of the e string wraps it around his finger makes a plectrum out of it because the guitar is it's dull as hell <laughs> so to get a bright sound and we cranked up all the top end on the channel and then he played and doubled that guitar part which is genius and incredible yeah. and then she piles back in with the last chorus and goes out and we're like, that's it. And we were right at that point where we had to literally take the tape off and take it in and mix it right then. And she said, I'm not coming back. I hate that song. I called Roberta and I said, I've never done this through, and I'll never do this to you again, but you have to come down and save the single. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, she hates the song. If, if you don't get here before she gets here, she's going to make me take the song off the record. And I just want you to hear it. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything else to you. I just want you to tell me what you think. So she comes down, get her set up, you know, and then Katie comes in. Oh, Roberta said, I got to come down. So she comes in, she's standing behind Roberta. And I leave the room and they play the track. And then I come back in at the very end. And Roberta just turns around to Katie and she goes, well, there's your single. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And did Katie like it at that point or she still hated it? I think she still hated it, but you know, the thing is she could do it live and kill it. You yeah. Know? So we just did it. Um, we went to see them. They toured the Ingenue album again, 25th anniversary this last two years ago. Yeah. We saw her at the Libero in Santa Barbara and the set and the sound and the band. She, it was really great. Wow. So that Vox can be, re, you know, and she created it on the tour right after we did that record, she was able to get that dope sound for the first 15 minutes of the show before. And she made a real, uh, 
she made it a priority to not speak to the audience until three of the songs went by. Right. So right. You could establish this, the mood. And, like, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but so, what a great record. But how, how different would that record have been if the drummer hadn't called her babe and you'd done it as a live band record? Exactly. I, that's and a completely different that record. record. That record was going to get made whether we made it or not, it made itself. It was like, and I kept calling back to LA and saying, this, this is going to be something incredible, but, but it's, it's very, very difficult to see where we're going. I mean, I am going into a black tunnel. I can't figure out what, what it's going to be, but it is really good. And they were, Warner were so supportive and they pulled out all the stops, you know, it had great videos. It had Mark Ramirez, uh, Mark, um, uh, Forgive me, I forgot his last name, but Mark uh, did this amazing video of it in the uh, Music Hall Theater in Santa Monica. They did this great, really cool video um, for Constant Craving. So, it, and it, I guess, subsequently, it sold four million records, something like that. Wow. It's a lot of records. It, yeah, it is. Very, very it is fantastic. It really is, and and I can only imagine what the other version of it would have been. Like, it's just. Because it is, it never feels like it's not live people. I mean, it's it's very personal, and you're in the room with it and whatever. But it is absolutely not a live band record. No, it, no it's they, almost it's like the. It feels to me like it's in the same family as all the Lanois records of that era. Like that's well, where it's living, you know. Well, so we have to give a tip of the hat to Danny because he at that moment was. You know, he was my main listening thing at that moment. I was listening to Acadia like all the time. Right. I love I love what he did. The does. Dylan record would have been right about then, right? Um Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, for me, like to you know, and that he did just down the road here in Oxnard. Um but what was weird for here's another side side story on that. So in Canada, and you probably know this, when you when the Junos come up. CanCon is a really important thing. So Canadian, it's the Canadian content law that says that a certain amount of content that's played on Canadian radio or done in public in Canada must contain Canadian citizens, you know, to, yeah. to do it. So we were lucky in Can content because we got CanCon content because we got a lot of play on Angenou up there. But it's the same for the Juno ceremonies. If you're an American, like I, I was the American on the album and Katie and Ben were the were the Canadians, they, they honor them at the ceremony. I was lucky to get invited to that. Um, and I was sort of pushed down the list a little bit, which, which I was fine with because that album had been super successful and everything. So we all dress up and we go to the thing and Katie gives out an award and Ben and I are sitting in the audience together. And, and then the producers of the year come up and Danny is, you know, of course he's, He's, he's from just down the road, you know, so he's, yeah. he's in the running and me and Ben and KD are in the running for Ingenue, right? And we won it. And, and I was so freaking shocked to win and so almost mortified by the fact that we won over Daniel because he was, was and is one of my favorite artists and one of my favorite producers and guys. I was just beside myself. I couldn't believe it, you know, and I walked up on stage and it was Celine Dion that calmed me down because she was the sort of like, you know, the hostess of the night. She actually said, no, walk, it'll be just like this. You walk out there and you just take that award. It's yours. You, you're going to love this. She calmed me down and got me to it. So that's, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah. That's great. I love Daniel. I love Daniel. I listen to Daniel all the time. I love to, have you ever seen the, the video of Daniel and Pharrell? Yes. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Two, you know, two opposite ends of the, yeah. of the creative spectrum. Maybe. Yeah, but really amazing. Know. And the shot of whiskey in the middle. Like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> anyway, if you haven't seen the video, you'll know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about when you watch it. So let's let's just go back and talk about the the Sun 60 record, only because that's when we met. So this is, yeah. a, this is an L.A. band. Um, yeah. Some very talented people in it. Really? Really talented. Yeah, Joan and, and David, especially, just Amazing. huge talents. And this is their first record. They were Far Cry at the time. They're yeah. making the record. But I was working with John Barnes, who was uh, an amazing keyboard player, synthesizer guy, and he had played on a lot of the L.A. Motown stuff and things. So I 
was working with him because he had a synclavier. And then you came in to start tracking and Mark was going to be engineering, Mark Ramirez, and yeah. you were producing. And yeah. you are, you had the one of the greatest assistants in the history of assistant engineers, Esteban. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to tell a story and then you tell me if this is what actually happened. So you go in for the first day of tracking and it's full yeah. live band. So it's a four piece band, I think, right? It's yeah. on an 8108, which is like, yeah. that's a nightmare any day of the week. But anyway, you get going. Mark is a ridiculously talented engineer. He's got everything set up. But basically, yeah. the first day is set up and getting everybody comfortable and everything like yeah. that. So then you go home and you come in the next day and Esteban is out in the live room. And he's like putting yeah. a couple microphones on stands. And I think Mark came in a bit early and he saw Tebby doing this and he's like so what are you doing he's like no no no, it's all cool i got it almost all set back up like oh what do you mean now again maybe i've exaggerated this in my own mind because he had come from south america where the sessions ran 24 hours a day there were two 12-hour sessions every day and you even shared reels of tape you'd flip it over you had tracks one through 12 and you'd flip the <laughs> tape over and someone else had tracks one through 12 all night so he had never ever even heard about a session that could be left set up overnight. So he had meticulously documented everything, torn it down until like one in the morning, and then got back there at six to set it all back up. It is true. Okay, good. Remember, yeah, and I remember thinking, and how do you, how do you, I mean, I couldn't be mad. I, I don't remember losing it. I was just No, like, no, I seem to remember you spent a little bit of time out in the lounge though. Like, I can't believe what's going on in there, but <laughs> we'll just see. Because I think there was some really weird stuff with the setup too. You were reamping some things out near the drums and like it was, there was a lot going on and he had torn everything down thinking he was going to have to do this every single night. It was incredible. Absolutely incredible. I know. And that room was so great. I love that room. And the mic locker there was great. And the... Yeah. I mean, and it's the history in that studio. That's where White Christmas was cut. Yeah. yeah. that's uh, And there were a bunch of other things cut there. Uh, well, obviously, Richard did all the pointers. Yeah, Richard there. Perry there for years. Amazing stories about Richard Perry, which, again, I doubt are true. But some really great stories from that studio in and there. And David mom got control of it. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had bought it, but then when they formed DreamWorks, it was a conflict of interest, so he wasn't allowed to have anything to do with it. And that's when his ex-wife took over and started running the studio, which is also when I met Lisa Roy, because she was acting as studio manager exactly. then. So, yeah, now, a very... Lisa's doing publicity for for UMG, so I get to see her all the time. Yeah, I mean, she's she's top of the game for everybody. Yeah. But yeah, it was a very... And now it's it's a parking lot. It's part of the Paramount yeah. parking lot. Well, that... that so that that, that uh, brings on a couple of other quick Ricky stories because my first long experience at 55 was Ricky stuff that I had done before the Sun 60 stuff. So... And then there was the later album, the Pop Pop album, which I, I, I mentioned that track to you. Um, yeah. Uh, that Dare, uh, which is amazing. But, uh, and that album I actually left. I started that album with Ricky and then and then we ended up um, needing to get into the Katie records on that. But um, when we were working on Flying Cowboys, Ricky was like her nerves were on the outside of her skin. And she really liked for the that room to always be set the way she wanted it to be set and what she did to evoke this psychedelic flying cowboy vibe is she got she went out and bought a bunch of psychedelic flying cowboy vibe as she got she went out and bought a bunch of pieces of art and cactus and stuff to put in the control room and she had really gone out of the way to make it really cool um over one weekend they had booked the room to a guy who was actually not a professional songwriter or a musician. He was a waiter in a restaurant, but he, <laughs> he would come in there and do his demos. Do you remember this happening? No. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just, when you mentioned the parking lot, I'll just run it down. Yeah. Road. Yeah. No, it's fine. So, so I come in on a Monday morning at about, I don't know, 10, I guess. Uh, and typically Ricky was coming down from, she was living in Ohio then. So she would either, have a hotel in LA or she'd come down from Ohio in the morning on Monday. So she's oftentimes she, the first of the week, she would get there a little bit late. 
So um, she came, <laughs> she came in, and I had come in, and I everything looked fine with me in the control room. To me in the control room, and I laid out a track that I knew she wanted to work on. It was satellites or something like that. Anyway. I had it all up on the board and I kind of got my sounds and I was going to drift out and see what was going on. And I saw her come in, you know, I ran into her in the lobby when she was coming in. I said, I'll come in in a minute. She's like, yeah, I just got to put my stuff down. So um, about a minute later, I hear this. Oh my God, what the, f you know, just like this expletives coming out of the control. You, you can swear on this. It's, you know, yeah. well, we, it's so, not like we we're going to lose a sponsor. So. <laughs> <laughs> She throws the door open and she goes, what the fuck happened to my cactus? And I'm like, I don't know what happened to your cactus. <laughs> I go in and there's this beautiful cactus plant, but the flower that had bloomed and was blooming beautifully on a Friday afternoon had fallen off and fallen on the floor. And she being, being Ricky and having had experiences that she'd had in the business before she thought somebody had, cut her flower off the cactus and purposely thrown it down to sort of <laughs> make her go insane, which she did. And this guy, so curiously enough, this guy is still trying to gather all of his stuff from the weekend's worth of work. And he's, he's writing a check for the time that he had spent there. And he's he got his little multi-tracks, his hands in there heavy. And, and he's trying to get out the door, whatever his name was. I don't even know. He was somebody I'd never heard of. And we never heard from after that, but he starts out in the road and, and, and she's grilling the receptionist and saying, who was in here over the weekend? And she said, well, you know, that guy that just left, it's uh, Bob or whatever his name was. And Ricky completely loses it, chases the guy out across, across Melrose, right? Traffic. She's, he's running with his tapes. He looks over his shoulder. He sees this crazy woman chase, chasing him in the street. She's, she's running through the traffic. He gets in his car, throws the tapes on the seat of the car shuts the door, the windows roll down. She reaches in the car and she's grabbing him as she's trying to pull out of the parking lot. Walter gets there and is running across Melrose to try to calm her down. <laughs> what the fuck happened? What the fuck happened? It was insane. It was insane. She was convinced that this guy had damaged her practice, right? Anyway, she came back in and she was huffing and puffing. And I got on great with her. So I could always kind of chill her out, you know? So I was like, look, look. I got here early. It had fallen on the floor. I'm almost sure it wasn't that guy. I think it happened this morning early and it wasn't me. I would never, you know, I'm trying to be really cool. With yeah. And we're standing out in the tracking room and she grabs, she grabs a lead weighted mic stand and swings it over her head and then lets it go sort of towards me. I don't think she was trying to hit me, but she was mad and she was going to break something. And I move out of the way and this thing hits the wall and it, it was <laughs> unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. So working working with that team was was definitely something. Wow. Okay, <laughs> that's something. Yeah. So, but you know, the thing is, is that I, I there were lots of other personal exchanges with Ricky, and we we've been friends outside of work, and um, in general, I always got on well with Ricky. We fought, but I always got on really well with her, and she, and I think that she is one of the most interesting artists in the world. You know, yeah. Incredible really amazing so God, there's so many other things and we obviously are going to spend a lot of time talking about elton john again because we right. have to but i just want to touch on a few things so when i was looking through your discography at first this one felt really out of place to me the sparks record but then hearing more about you hanging out with Georgia Moroder, you being a synth guy, thinking you're going to go to synthesizer school, whatever that is, you know? Yeah, so sure. in a way, that record makes a lot more sense than a lot of the other stuff in your discography. Yeah. So how'd that come about? And because it's a really different record. I mean, it's a very electronic record. It is, there's not, no attempt to like, for it to be anything like any of the rest of your catalog. And, and at the time it was a Lindrum and Ronnie playing, a, a, you know, a Jupiter 8. And I think that's all that's on it. He just... He just came up with a million patches. Russell sang all those parts. We did it at Westlake um, and they were signed to Giorgio's company, but they had made a deal. Um, they were somehow involved in the production of a film that was going to be called Modesty Blaze. And I think it was Paramount and Paramount decided to not pick up the film. And so what we had to do is we had to make, we had to go back in and make sure that it, we had already recorded the track. We had to make sure that it didn't sound like Modesty Plays, that it sounded like Modesty Plays. So Russell had to harden the P on a couple of the tracks in the stacks that we did right. so that it 
little bit more. And that, oh, so anyway, we did that and it was, you know, we didn't want to throw away the track. So we, Giorgio had a deal uh, for them with, um, you know, one of the, one of the German labels, I can't remember who it was, but it was one of the, at the time, one of the big German labels. And we put it out in Europe and it came out um, in France and it was a hit. Modesty Blaze, uh, Modesty Blaze was a hit in France. So that led me to go over there and then that's where another electronic sort of period happened. I went to meet them in Paris because they were doing these radio shows where, have you ever seen these things where you lip sync to your record, but you're in a radio audience? It goes out of the radio, but yeah. you're standing there live or lip syncing. And so we did a bunch of these and I went around with them to these things. And then the people that we had, that had put the record out in France asked me to mix an album while I was there. And that's actually what shaped my whole life from then on, because they sent me to Brussels to do it. And that's where I met Dan Laxman, who you may know Dan from his, you know, the Sakamoto records he's made and from Thomas Dolby's The Flat right. Earth and from his band, um, um, Telex. But that's also where I met Katia, my wife. And, right. uh, so that whole section of my life in electronica and Brussels uh, and with jazz jazz players in Brussels and then and then going back and forth between Brussels and Paris and where I worked at Studio Market Day in Paris um, doing remixes for for the label that that uh, put out the Sparks record um, for cash to keep myself alive over there. Right. Anyway, Ronnie and Russell have been good friends forever, and I and I and and they are truly stars and two of the most interesting wonderful nice guys and you know just they're they just they get up and they're stars and they they're like old hollywood stars they know right. how to look and look they know how to be they're 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 interesting they know just when to drop the quirky stuff and make you go what the hell you know or, right. or you know, the covers of their albums are great they're just amazing i love yeah them. god incredible. and I've, I've remained friends with them a, a lot and i i, I worked on that little Beethoven album they did with uh, one of the key tracks was called Lights Out Ibiza. Uh, and it was it was this track that they were going to do under another name. And then they eventually put it out as Sparks. But I did a bunch of mixes on that. I don't know if they ever used any of the mixes that I did, but um, I've worked with them a bunch. Right. So, all right, we're going to jump around a little bit so we can then come back. I'm going to not be so lengthy with my answers. So. No, it's fine. It's I mean, we can go as long as you want. It's Again, <laughs> we have no sponsors. So, um, but there are just a couple other things I'd love to just hear a little about. I mean, one is Lulu. Yeah. And this is, so when was this, I mean, this is pretty far along in her career at this point, oh, right? Yeah. 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 But well, it, it, and well, let's hear about it first, but it felt as though it, in a way it's almost a throwback to your mom in like what was going on in her career and what her career was. And so- yeah. Um, so Lulu came th from Elton because Elton and Lulu have been friends for years. So when I started working with Elton in the early nineties, after the, you know, it was starting, starting this period of records that I did with him, um, his friends would come around a lot and Lulu is one of his close friends. And so is, you know, Kiki is one of his close friends still. And, um, George Michael, you know, they're, they're, all these people would come around to the studio to say hi, you know. So I met Lou, Lou at one of his parties. And then um, she always really liked the records that I made. And so he did this, he helped her put together this album that's really good if you ever get a chance to listen to it. Um, that's like duets with her and interesting people. And Elton wanted to do one of the duets. And because the KD track, Teardrops, was not ever really, KD didn't want Elton to put it out as a single because it, it collided with something she was trying to do as a single. Right. I think he always felt that it was never completely done. And that's an interesting track we can talk about in a minute. But he asked me to, uh, to re kind of revisit it and, make it an Elton and Lulu track. So entered it and make it an Elton and Lulu track. So, and she was way down with it. She was way interested with it. So, although I never, I didn't do the vocals with it on that track. I didn't do the vocals with her. I got the track and I mixed it here. Um, and, uh, and I've 
communicated with her and stayed in touch with her for years. So, and she's a, a wonderful artist, but you should hear that album. I'm not sure, I, I can't remember the name of the album, but there's this, the thing that stuck out on that album was the version of Sail on Sailor, the, the Beach Boys song. Yeah. That she did with Sting. Have you heard that? No, no. Oh, God. It's one of, it's one of my favorite tracks because Sting is so cool on that track. He's just so, that groove, that shuffle groove, to, to back, to, 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 and she's killing it. They, they're great together. Anyway, wow. Check it out. Well, yeah. so, okay, there are other things we can, I mean, there's, you know, Roy Orbison, among other things. Yeah. Well, okay, let's stop. We got to talk about Roy Orbison. Let's hear about okay. Roy Orbison because it's Roy Orbison. So, so okay, so, <laughs> so I was asked by Barbara Orbison post Roy's passing if I could help put together um, this track posthumously with KD and Roy. So I went down to New Orleans and I did it at, I can't remember the name of the studio that we used. It wasn't Danny's studio, but I spent time at Danny's studio while I was down there during that. We ended up doing um, this Roy track and then, and then I mixed it down there. Um, and by virtue of the fact that I was involved, I got a production credit on it and stuff like that. But I'll rewind you to my very first experience with Roy Orbison, which is, in Nashville at RCA Studios. My mom was doing one of her records, one of her big records there. And she would take me along to her sessions. And one of the things, they always let me go because I never mess, you know, I never mess things up. And I wouldn't, I knew to be quiet when the red light was on and all that stuff. So I'm probably six or seven years old, maybe, maybe older, maybe eight. And I had made myself a little fort under this grand piano on this hardwood floor that was in the middle of the room. And my mom was in the control room listening to um, tracks that they had done the day before. I was alone in the tracking room under this piano. And the back door of the studio opened out to the parking lot. So the back door opens and it's a sunny day outside. And this blast of light comes through the door and this silhouette steps into the light with a guitar case. And I know from the silhouette that it's Orbison. <laughs> got the Cuban heels on and a whole bit. Wow. And he shouts into my mom, hey, Susie, what are we doing today? <laughs> and I will never forget that. And he walked wow. past me. And then he looked under the piano and went, hey, Greggy. Like that. <laughs> That's one of my earliest memories of him. And so for anything that I could do, and, and I became friendly with Barbara after he passed. And I really liked Barbara a lot. Did you, did you ever work with Barbara or know her no, very well? No, no. She was no, not at all. Really great. Really a very interesting lady and really took care of his legacy very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, course, and yeah. to the point where he'd, he'd had a, I mean, he was on Saturday Night Live not long before he died. Like, I mean, he had a real resurgence at the end, which he, it shouldn't even have been a resurgence. He should have always been that big. But, exactly. you know, but, and I feel like, and I, you know, I make this stuff up and I'm probably wrong, but I, I really feel like the, the legacy of, I mean, all the KD stuff, but certainly Ingenue and Chris Isaac at that time, like that's all just oh, yeah. like taking Roy forward, basically. Oh, totally. That was what it was all about. And, you know, obviously her versions of, you know, her version of crying that she did with Don was and, you know. Um, yeah. Well, okay. There's other stuff, but which we can come to at some point, but let's, so we've talked about a bunch of the duets and the duet between Elton and KD is what kind of got you back into the Elton camp. Right. Yeah. So let's start there. And then there's a long road to go. So however, okay. however you want to travel it, let's do it. I'll get, I'll get you there quick. So we had made, we had made two KD albums. And are you keeping in touch with Elton this whole time or? No, no there was, and he didn't, there was a whole time previous to him getting sober in the eighties when he fell out of touch with a lot of people that knew him. There wasn't any one particular thing that made me fall out of touch with him, except that he, you know, he, he, he was bigger than life at one point and it was not very easy to get to him. Right. And then what, what has happened in his career over the years. And we talk about it sometimes is, you know, there, there are new people that come into his life and there, there are new management people, there are new things that are around him. And these things become kind of barriers to entry for people who have known him for years. And, right. you know, I'm not very forceful about saying, you know, on the phone, I got to talk to him right now. You know, I'm not going to do that stuff. So there was, there was a natural sort of, he sort of fell out of, uh, 
he went into a different orbit and 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 i think you know for ray cooper he ray and him didn't talk for a long time um steve brown and him didn't talk for a long time so the people who had been very 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 close to him were sort of they were in different orbits you know and i felt that i was in a different orbit um but connie hillman who chris hillman's wife has worked for elton for years so i've known i've known connie since she was like 18 and I was 15 or something, you know. And they lived here in Ojai, Chris and Connie. So um, I was really despondent because I had made these records and I had gotten, you know, I had been, the records that I'd made had been nominated for Grammys and they had sold a lot of records, but you know how the music business works. The pipeline can be very long, very, you know, have a lot of uh, detours in it so that your your ability to make a living sometimes gets crazy you know you just you just get so stressed because the the royalties are there you know they're there you've just made a big record you know you think the phone would ring the money should be there it's not that you know it's not that yeah. way the phone stops ringing and the money gets dried up and you start to have to look for ways to to yeah keep things going until it all starts again so i was in this despondent moment you know i've got two kids and my wife and i cat and i took the kids to santa barbara for the day and I was determined to have a great day out with them, even though I was thinking like, well, that's probably it. That was my 15 minutes and I can just kind of, you know, <laughs> talk about it later. And I got home, the kids were tired. I think it was a Sunday night and they went off to bed and, or to have a bath and go to bed. And I decided I'll check the answering machine. And there was a message on it from Connie. And Connie said, hey, Elton called me today. He wants to do a duet with you and KD. Can you give me a call? I was like, <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> yeah, I got it. So I called Connie. And she's like, yeah, you know, he's just really loves the KD records that you've made and he wants to talk to you. So I said, well, you know, where is he? And she said, he's, he's in London. I said, well, it's too late today. And she said, yeah. So I said, uh, well, I'm here. I'm here all day tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Yeah. And sure enough, first thing in the morning, the phone rings and he says, hey, what's going on? And I said, I'm here. What's, you know, it's, it's, everything's good. And he said, I know, I just love the records you've been making. I just love them. And listen, MCA want me to deliver this duets album. And I don't want to deliver like all the old duets. I want to put some new stuff on it. So I've done this track with, um, with Don and uh, Bonnie, we've done, I don't know what they did. It was like True Love or something. They did an older track, you know, because he had worked with Don Was a little bit during yeah. that time, right? My cognizance of him at that moment was that he was back in Euro mode and he was doing the whole Versace thing and he had made this album called The One that was that Chris, Chris Thomas produced and it was very, it had an electronic undertone to it that I loved. And I loved his the sound of his voice and the songs that were amazing. So I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do with Katie? And I was like, he said... He said, would you do a duet with me and KD? Do you think you can get her to do a duet with me? And I was just like, are you kidding? She'll be all over that, you know? He said, well, I'll be in LA tomorrow. Um, I got some ideas for songs or I can write something if we want, you know, I can get Bernie to write something and I'll just we'll do one of my tunes, but I'd like doing a cover or something. So I'm like, okay. So Katie was in LA. I call her, I said, you want to go see Elton with me? She said, sure. So he's staying at the Four Seasons on Doheny. We go down and he's got this whole setup, this vinyl setup, and he can't stop playing this song called Teardrops by Zachariah and Zachariah or Womack and Womack, right? And he's like, I, I just was on tour with Clapton in Japan and we played this backstage every day. And why don't we do this song? And it's all disjointed and it's got weird stop times and start time. And, and I'm like, can I have the vinyl? I'll take it home and I'll come up with an arrangement. So, I took the vinyl home. Katie was like down, you know, I'd love to do this. So I take it home and I transfer it to tape and I cut it into an arrangement and I send it back to him on a cassette. And he's like, brilliant, let's do it. And within a few days we were in ocean way doing it. And wow. Katie rolled up on her Harley. Um, Kurt Biscara and I are really close friends and Kurt had done the martini ranch stuff with me and the Mark Thompson stuff. And I just said, will you play drums and Dean, will you play guitar? And, and Elton's like, get Nathan East. I love Nathan's play. You know, so I called Nathan and he's like, are you kidding? I'll be there. So it's it's literally, you know, the downbeat is like 11 a.m. Elton's there at 10. I got him a Wurlitzer and 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 that brand in the back room at, at Ocean Way. And we cut it in that back room. 
on the board that Ni Nigel bought it, right? That that board. Oh, the Dalcon, yeah. Yeah. So uh, so he comes in and he's like looking for it. And I, he said, what key are we in? And I said, you know, I, for near as I can tell, it's like, it's F sharp. And he's like, okay, fine. And he said, no, I can take it up. I can hit those high notes, you know, and he, and he gets it, right? And I'm like, okay, when you get there, remember there aren't, there aren't three stops, there's only one. And then the next one, there's two. And, you know, we'll build it that way. And he's like, fine. So he works it all out. Kurt comes in and, you know, the drum doctor's there and he sets up Kurt's drums. And Kurt comes in early, of course, always. Dean's stuff is arriving and Nathan shows up and Elton's just banging away on, on this thing, trying to get a groove, trying to get a tempo. And Kurt just walks out, doesn't know Elton yet, walks out and just, boom, just does the Motown drum fill and blasts right in and Elton just goes digs in and they just play for 10 minutes straight just like yeah you know, and then and then he goes fuck you know and he walks in the control room and he comes up and he says who is that motherfucker i said that's my buddy kurt and he said jesus christ that's amazing so anyway we did the track katie came in later in the afternoon sang it elton decided he wanted to come back in and double parts the next morning literally no problem doubled them and then he said i love it just the way it is and i said Let's let's have a reef at a string arrangement. And he's like, Oh, that's cool. Let's do that. So a reef, I called his office and they said he was in Istanbul. And so I FedExed him this package with a cassette of it. And and I drew a chart of how, like a, you know, because I can't write music. So I I drew a chart of how I kind of wanted it to sound rhythmically. And then he was like, totally, um, you know, he called me, he said, I'm totally into this, I'll do it. And then he met me at, uh, he met me in LA about two weeks later and he sat at the piano and played me his string arrangement on the piano. And he said, and the reason why there's all these kind of hot notes and like, it sounds a little Eastern at times is because I was in Istanbul and I was influenced by the music there. And he said, so I think this will work really well with, you know, with the fiddles now. And we went into Ocean Wayne, cut it, and that was it. That track was just like bang, you know. Wow. And then the little Richard track with Elton, and we went to Atlanta for that, and that was beautiful. That was a beautiful thing because Richard was scared to death. Really? So petrified to work with Elton, yeah. And of course, Elton is like, I mean, Elton is little Richard. I mean, when you think about yeah. it, he wanted Richard. And I mean, Richard everybody's was, little Richard, really, yeah. but yeah, he was <laughs> petrified. So uh, we had to go. I had to go get him out of a dressing room in the studio down there and bring him, bring him to the main room and kind of just, you know, and he was, I remember he was just like beside himself. He was like hyperventilating. Wow. And, you know, and Elton was great. He was there for him. And eventually the way we cut the track was we did a live, we had some of the instruments that he had cut to a click. Elton had cut it to a click to write it. And so we used that click. Kurt played live drums uh, Nathan played bass. Elton played some piano and Richard sat next to Elton on the piano bench. And when he got him sort of comfortable enough, we put a mic between them and they sang it right there. And we maybe did two passes and a comp and that was it. And, wow. And Greg Wells played bass, uh, played um, organ on that track. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. And Jerry Hay. It was one of those things where I was chasing this sound that I really wanted this huge sound to, you know, for the choir and stuff. And we didn't have a choir on it. I went to South Central LA to church one morning to, with a friend of mine because he said they had a great choir there. And I went and I thought I'll use this, you know, non-professional cool choir. It'll sound really cool because it's they're slightly out of tune and it hit the wall and I made a big mistake doing that. It didn't, it wasn't very good. The kid, we got the kids in the studio and they were frozen. Right. They couldn't even so i was like call andre so i call andre and i'm like can you can you bring the team and come in and like 30 people roll in and uh and i got richard to come down for the session and uh he knew all of them anyway so he sat there the whole time you know he's such a sweet guy every every other word was shut up you know <laughs> Take it again. you know he's just amazing um so we we did that at uh at the big room at east west what's that what was it? I guess it was the, in it was one. still ocean. You know, the, yeah, one. Yeah. Right. So we did the choir in there. And, and that's Andre did, Crouch, just for the people Andre watching Crouch, who yeah, don't, absolutely. who may not and, know. Uh, and then, and then when I was done, management called me and said, you know, you've, you've made a very expensive track so far. 
I was like, fuck, what do I do? And they were like, we'll talk to him. So I call out and he's like, no, 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 no. This is my gift to Richard. This is my gift to Richard. What do you want to do? And I said, nah, I think horns would sound with the guys like get Jerry Hay and do the right horns. And I got Jerry Hay and did the horns. And then Greg came in and played organ on it. And it was like, so it's called the power. And when Richard passed out, then I talked uh, that day and it was really sad for both of us. And yeah, I was scrambling around looking for pictures and all I could find was a picture of me and Kat, my wife, with Richard in the studio in Atlanta. We couldn't find any pictures yet. We think they they exist, but we're trying to find pictures of Elton and Richard together. Right. So, um, but, you know, he was he was really a special guy. Yeah. Really cool. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So and Bernie, Bernie yeah, I mean, if you ever want to go back and listen to a great Bernie top and lyric that is very valid at this moment in time when the world is coming unglued listen i mean go read the lyric to the power and you can see that these you know that richard had been up against it for a lot of years yeah and and come through it yeah 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 it's it's well okay we're not we're not going there at all um but yes absolutely so so from the duets then you end up making his next how many records well i made he he asked me that night at ocean way that we did teardrops if if i was free in january of the following year of 2000 or 1994 and you know i'm like my my wife's looking at me and he's in between us but he's got his back to her i must have looked like i was gonna have a heart attack because he said I've got this record planned, but I really want to do it with you now. And I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And it was one of those things where you want to make fun of it and go, oh, I'm not available, you know, or something like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I was, I couldn't believe it. I just said to him, I'm with you wherever you want to well, go. Well, because you're, you're 16 years old again, sitting in that control <laughs> yeah. room, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so he said, I'm going to have to make it in England for tax reasons. Um, and I want to, I want you to find the studio. I've worked everywhere there. So you, you just do what you want. So I went off on this studio tour and I was, I had been working at SARM and I was thinking, well, maybe SARM, maybe we'll go out to, to outside, right? Trevor's place in the SARM hook end. Yeah. The yeah, exactly. So hook end. Yeah. Um, Cause Trevor and Jill had just bought it and uh, back then. And then, and I looked, you know, I looked around at all kinds of places. I went to, you know the townhouse and abbey road you know but i ended up at air because he said look let's let's go to air and i'm thinking all the time i know it's there i've been driven by lindhurst hall before from the outside i don't know this is this is a big this is a big train set to take on you know and they hadn't finished the building yet they were still putting the carpets yeah because what what year did they move in there wasn't that long before that right it was it was a few weeks before we started working it. They, right. they moved in at the end of 2000. I mean, uh, 1993. Right. Uh, it had been in, in construction all the way during that time. For, for those of you who are listening, Air Lindhurst is a, is a Gothic church in North London that has been transformed into a world-class recording complex. And it has some residencies in the top, which were often used by people visiting or doing things like, you know, David Arnold's had a room up there for years. Buckmaster used it for a long time. We lived up there for three years. We had a, we just kept that as a flat for years. Um, and then there's, there's, there's the hall, which is a huge Gothic hall with a tall ceiling where a lot of orchestral work is done for film. And then there's studio one, which is a Neve room and uh everybody from Coldplay to Paul Young to lots of people who worked in that room. And then there's on the second floor, there's studio two, which is an SSL room. And then there's three post-production suites as you go up. Yeah. And then there's other, David's got a big room up there now for writing and stuff. Um, but we, we decided to work at air and I'd never been Allison or Andy strange or any of the staff at air. So I, I went up with a little dat that I had of teardrops of the album track. And they're like, I said, I'm looking for, a, a, you know, I, I need about three months. And, and Allison's, you know, they, well, Elton's worked at Air for years at Oxford Circus, but he hadn't worked at Air yeah. first yet. And, and I th- I'm sure when I walked in the door, they were like, you know, you're not Chris Thomas, you're not Gus, you're not, you know, you're not, you know. 
So I said, well, let me play the tracks that we're doing. And they were just like, holy crap, that sounds, you know, that's great. I said, well, I want to do this whole album. And since you don't have that other room ready, can we do it right here in the hall? And Andy was just clearing up a session that they did for the Brian Adams, Sting, Rod Stewart, Three Musketeers thing. Right. They'd done it that day in the yeah. hall. And uh, so I said, yeah, let's do it here. And then I flew, <laughs> I flew back to New York the next day to kind of report into him because him and Ray Cooper were doing a two-man tour at that point on the East Coast. It was just Elton would start it. Ray would come out and do his whole Ray thing for an hour. And then Elton would do a couple soft things. And Ray would do a solo. And Elton would take a break. And then they'd wrap it up. But we were in like Hartford, Connecticut or somewhere like that. I took, I remember getting off the plane, going to the hotel, dropping my bag, getting a commuter train to, to Hartford, Connecticut, and knowing that the gig was supposed to start at seven and it's like 7.20. And I'm like, way late. I'm not going to see him. And he flew in. So I, now I got a problem of getting to him before he gets out of the gig onto a plane. And I'm having a panic attack. And the cab gets me to the gig and the guys are at the back door and they all know me. So they like, let me in. I'm running down this hallway and I get to his dressing room and I walk in kind of trying to not sweat and be cool. And he's still standing there and the crowd's going, <laughs> you just pounding for him to come out, you know? And he's like eating a peanut or something. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? There's, you know, shouldn't you be on stage? And he says, I wasn't going to start without you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Ray's standing there. And he said, so where are we going to record? I said, air, Lindhurst. He was like, great, let's go. You know, that's it. <laughs> Boom. That was it. He went on stage, killed it. And um, that was that was it. We just went to London and started. I did the Eddie Reader album before that. I did an album with Eddie. Here, I started at Ocean Way and her and Mark Nevin, her co-writer, had a massive fight in the middle of it. That's a one. That's one to live through. When you, I mean, I don't know how many times you guys have gone through this, but when, when the creative team dissolves in front of you and there's like almost like things flying through the room, you know, I, I had to figure out a way to finish that record. So once they split and Mark went back to England, I just rented a house, a big house up here in Ohio, and put the whole band in it. Put Eddie in the house and bought a bunch of gear and started making the records. Right. And, it in like six weeks here and then i took it back to london to mix it in studio two at air so that i could test the room before mixing the album record there you know so i was at air for a long time that year i think it was about 10 months straight. and so who was the band on that elton record because obviously you've been working with a bunch of american guys on duets and yeah so it was his stage band so it was uh charlie morgan on drums spider morgan who, if you got, if you know who Charlie Morgan is, he's done lots of session work over the years, and he was Kate Bush's drummer on right. things like Running Up That Hill, things like that. Um, and also Elton's road drummer and studio drummer. Um, and Elton wanted to make it with his with his band, right? And part of the reason was that Sting had just made Ten Summoners Tales, and Elton and Sting were very close at that point, and he was like, "I want to make a record with my band, the way you made a record with your band." <laughs> So Bob Birch was playing bass, um, brilliant bass player and a really sweet guy and always there. Um, Davey played guitar and mandolin and sitar and all the electric stuff. Um, and has a lot to do with the way the songs get formed, you know, with Elton, as he's Elton's MD. Um, and then Guy Babylon came a little bit later to play keyboards. Um, because what we wanted to do was try to get Elton to set the tone for the keyboard overdubs on the album by what I remembered from Yellow Brick Road, right? Which right. was, he had a piano and then he had like a tack piano or something and then he'd have, or he would detune the piano and double it up. And he had a Farfisa and a weird little lamp that he could overdrive for that album. So like, I thought, well, why don't we put a keyboard in the control room by the desk you know, so you can get the power and the glory of the monitors. And we'll just have a little rack with some like a vintage keys and a few other things that he can start, but we'll capture all the MIDI. Right. And we'll get him to play other parts. And we put, we set up three grand pianos and an organ. And then Davey asked um, Adrian Elton's um, uh, assistant to bring down the harmonium that Elton had, that Davey had given Elton during the making of Yellow Brick Road. He brought, he brought he bought him a pedal harmonium like a christian harmonium yeah and so we had that in the in out in the room next to his 
acoustic pianos. And we started the album there uh, with those guys. And then once Guy came on, uh, we started getting deeper into keyboard stuff and Elton started to not play as many keyboard things, which it's not that I wanted, didn't want Guy to play. I wanted Guy to play, but I really wanted Elton to set the tone yeah. for how those parts were done. And, and also it was, it was, I felt like I needed to engage him in the record making process on that record to not leave things done so that he would get onto something else. Cause he's an incredibly busy guy and he loves just checking the boxes and splitting. Right. Right. So in this case, I wanted him to linger so that he thought more and he wrote more songs. And so we did 20 songs for that record. And then Buckmaster came and that was like one of the most amazing moments of my whole life when Buck right. when Buckmaster came because me being such a huge Elton fan and Buckmaster being such a big part of his sound and such a wonderful human being. Um, we immediately became very close friends and he just delivered so much on that record. And he overwrote, you know, he would write links between songs and he would, he would add parts that didn't, you know, we ended up not using, but just, he was just fully invested, which right. was great. We had this whole team there. And then um, Elton and I wanted George to write something. So we, he wrote this song on that harmonium called Latitude. And um, it sounded like for no one or for, or like, um, you know, one of the songs from Rubber Soul or Revolver. Right. Anyway, with him, you know, like we can work it out, right? That sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. That's a slightly larger than life. You know, Charlie played a great big marching band, kick drum, a hi hat with a tambourine on the top of it and a set of brushes. And that was the drum set on the track. And George listened, <laughs> Selma and I went toddling into the refectory there for lunch, you know, and George is sitting there eating a sandwich. And we, we were kind of like, yeah, let's just do it. So, yeah, we <laughs> sidle up to him, you know, Elton on one side and me on the other. And we're like, uh, we got this really cool track. Um, and we'd really like you to write a string arrangement for it. Like this, you know, he's yeah. like, of course, no son, yeah. Of course, no problem. <laughs> it wasn't even a pause. I couldn't believe it. I wow. was like, I was thinking to go, well, you know, I'm with the queen tomorrow. And, you know, it's just fucking <laughs> work, right? So, so, so he finishes his sandwich and we both grab like a Purdy's or something, go back in the control room and we play in this song and he goes, I got it. I'll, I'll have it ready for you next week. And he did. He walked in and it was George doing a string arrangement. He had a double quartet and he spoke to them. You know, he was the boss. Good morning. It's a 9 a.m. call, you know. Good morning. Yeah. What we're working on today is the new Elton John. You know, it's very direct. Right. And and uh, it was inc absolutely incredible. I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. That's amazing. Well, because did he already have an office there? Was he there a lot? So you know, he had that he had that little perch up there. It's yeah. Because he, interesting story. He so. There, there was a, as they built the building, they kept a lot of the, um, they had to keep a lot of the ornate uh, stained glass and windows and stuff. So there was a window to a room that was some sort of, I don't, I don't know what it was, but it was almost like an extension of the mezzanine and it went around right. on that. And he kept it as an office to work in. So when he was up there sort of making calls or doing what he did, he would watch us. He would watch the sessions. So that was another incredibly intimidating thing. Yeah. To be down with Elton, like, you know, trying to command the, the ship there for, for Elton. And, and Elton's writing. George is sitting there looking down. And on any given day, Chris Thomas and Gus Dudgeon would show up and sit in the control room with me. Just to hang and out. Like, fuck, you know. And, and, and how, were how were they hanging out? Because obviously they'd known Elton forever and, it, you know, but they were just coming I, to be a, be a buddy. Yeah. God, you know, we did this track called Believe and Chris came in a couple of days after we cut it and we played it for him. And, and he took me aside after when he was just like, man, I love that track. That's a fabulous track. So powerful. And I was just like, fuck, this is, you know. You've made every record that I adore from the Sex Pistols to the Lion King. You know, well, at that point, Lion King hadn't come out, but I had heard it all. And I was like, how can you span that? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. it's insane. It's insane. And take over the White Album from George and end up making it the edgy White Album that it was, right? Yeah. Play the electric piano or the 
harpsichord on piggies and things like that. I mean, it's just insane. And then, you know, and Gus, in my book, having, you know, from engineering time of the season to, you know, discovering, Roy Thomas Baker talks about like Gus, like he's, you know, the, the real, the, the governor. I mean, like, you know, yeah. Gus taught everything. And, you know, and all the records that I love that Gus made, including like Davies solo stuff and, you know, things that were made for Rocket that were little records. They weren't big. They were little records or Kiki's records or whatever. You know, I just love Gus, right? And to sit there with him and have him talk. I said, you know, didn't you VSO his vocals on these, you know, on, on this stuff? Because I really want to try to get that timbre out of him here. And he's like, no, he sang like a choir boy. I mean, that was just, I never, I promise you, I never slowed the machine down and tracked and then sped it up. Just, he had that range. Wow. Can so, we just go back know, to Chris Thomas played harpsichord on piggies? Why didn't I know I, that? I think, I, yeah, I believe you got to look it up. But I'll look but, it up. That's insane. Correct me publicly if I'm wrong. No, I look. Let's say it's true because I want I'm that to be sure true. That, I well, you know it. the relationship, right? Like Chris and Elton have a fiery relationship, and there's a third cog in that wheel. Skyla Kanga, who is the wonderful harpist who played on all of the early album records, and also subsequently plays. In, you know, on many things, she's she's an ex, an astounding harpist, session harpist in Monk. Um, Skyla and Chris and Elton all went to the Royal Academy of Music. You know, they went to school together. So when Chris, because Elton used to be George and John Burgess's um, Thursday afternoon piano accompanist. <laughs> you know that? No. So you no, know, Elton worked for George, and and he for that. He would come on Thursday afternoons and he would he'd put the sheet music up and, you know, a, a new budding young girl or boy singer would come in and do their bit. And Elton would accompany them, you know, to the to the music. And that's wow. and he was employed by John Burgess and George Martin to do that. And his pay was a meal ticket. <laughs> and that's where the song Meal Ticket came from, from the Captain Fantastic album. Amazing. And so when you're when you're going to approach George with Elton the fucking legend, you know, to talk to George about writing a string arrangement. Elton was still nervous about it. Right, right. He's and still George the piano boy. He's still his boss. <laughs> so it was just God. very weird, you know, totally weird. And it's, anyway, Skyla and Skyla comes into it, and it's like Chris Thomas and Skyla and, and Elton standing together, having a cup of tea and talking about school and stuff. You know, it's just weird. It's amazing. And actually, Buckmaster fit in there somewhere too. I can't remember that. They crossed paths at that time. Wow. But um, pretty amazing. Yeah. So we, we were in the hall for 10 weeks. Um, and it was 10 weeks uninterrupted. We were locked out and to, in a Gothic church for 10 weeks. It was amazing. Yeah. And they were extremely productive. And Bernie was there. And I love Bernie. I get along great with Bernie. He's just, a, you know, I thought he was the coolest guy in the world when I never, but way before I met him, I thought, wow. Who's Bernie Taupin? That guy's just amazing. He's got the best gig in the world. You know? <laughs> he's only got to write 10 lyrics a year and he's like, you know, <laughs> larger than life. Yeah, but now, they're all cool. pretty damn good. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. Before he started Made in England, before we started Made in England, we were doing setup for a couple of days before and Bernie came to London early and he came down to the studio to air to look at the room while we were setting up and when he got there, he handed me a black envelope uh, full of lyrics, and he said, "Take them out and let, let's let's talk for a minute." So I took I took like I don't know, it was fifteen lyric sheets out of this black envelope, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, "They've all only got a single word title." And he said, "Yeah, it's, that's the theme of the album: England, man, house, believe, blessed." Right? He had done, he had conceptualized this whole thing. And so I said, it feels like plastic on a band record. And he said, yeah, that's it. That's what we should make. Let's make a plastic on a band record. And I was like, wow, this is too cool. And he said, so what wow. we'll do is I'll do my thing with Elton. We, we, we know how to do our thing. But don't worry if some things are rejected, they'll come back around. And sure enough, first day, he, he, he goes out and he says, don't, you know, he told me, don't, don't, don't give Elton those lyrics until I give them to him. So he goes out and he sets three lyrics on the piano. And Elton sits down and he just starts 
playing a little bit. And then he grabs two of them, throws them on the floor and does this one called building a bird. And he had it written in 12 minutes. And I went back and reviewed all the doubts that I ran of his writing recently for, for, cause we're working up to a whole bunch of cool Elton stuff for the future. So I had to go back and review a bunch of that stuff. And it is amazing. It's just incredible. Yeah. The footage from, I, is it, Oh, is it Honky Chateau? One of the records made there, it must have been Honky Chateau, but the the little bits of footage of him sitting down oh. with the lyric and just it, the song oh, exploding yeah. out of him. Yeah, that was when I was there when they did those films. That was Brian Forbes, the the great actor and and documentary filmmaker, came over with his team from London and they shot Elton and the band while they were doing Yellow Brick Road. And that's where that footage came from. Right. And, you know, in the breakfast um, room. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's in the the classic album series. It's just astounding. Yeah, exactly. So that so they did that during that ten days that I was there. They came, they came. Right. And that's how it worked. I mean, he would get up, come in. There was a Spanish lady who, with her kids, ran the the like tidied the place up and cooked everybody food, and she'd make tortilla in the morning. You know, Spanish tortilla, and and I just remember how good it was <laughs> the band loved it. it was lots of black coffee in the morning and then lots of wine in the evening and they were just that was how they did it right it was great and still to this day so and i also love that the album you made was called made in england just in case there were any tax questions that came up later <laughs> yeah yeah no was question gonna, well, i think we i think he wanted to call it believe to start with and then he thought that was maybe a little like not as i don't know something and i remember him calling me in the middle of the night and saying i i got a new idea i want to call the album made me because it's made in england right and yeah I was like yeah yeah that's whatever you want to do <laughs> yeah you are in fact elton john <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i, lo- I just a- love how many people like and i might be misremembering this but from what i can remember elton's first gig possibly in the states but definitely in la was the troubadour yeah. And he was introduced by Neil Diamond. Like Neil set the gig up. And so yeah. there's just always been this thing of just, I mean, starting off with the George Martin thing, which I had no idea about. That's It's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. The, just, you know, he was there. I mean, if you, you have to get, we have to get John Higgins, who is a, a good friend of mine who works with Elton as well. He's he's an archivist and a, and a, and a, guy, and a historical consultant for Elton. But um, Higgins reminds me, because I'm because i reading this thing about, it's not unusual by Tom Jones, right? In, in the wiki of that song, because I love Tom, right? And I, I go back sometimes and listen, and just read, you know, we got nothing else to do sometimes. <laughs> so I'm reading the wiki of it's not unusual and it says Elton played piano on it. And I'm like, is that factual? And he said, Higgins said, yeah, that's factual. And also he likes saying the backgrounds on Either Delilah or She's a Lady, one of those tracks. You're joking. Remember. But Elton was hanging out at, those were mostly cut at rack, as far as I know. Um, and Gordon Mills was producing him. And I think the deal is, is that Elton, like, just, you know, he just knew if he hung out enough, something was going to happen. So he was always around. Wow. Get Reg. Get Reg to play piano on this. He's great. Reg can play organ on it. <laughs> Well, I say this a lot when I talk to to students. It's like the only way to be at the right place at the right time is to be everywhere all the time. Yeah. And eventually, uh, it's incredible. So we can, you've been through his catalog. You're you're going through the second time doing surround mixes. So you started off, you did most of the catalog in 5.1. Now you're doing an Atmos. I don't want to get geeky on this at all. I just want to hear a little bit, really, actually, sort of creatively, what, because obviously the records were, were recorded to be played back in stereo, and yeah. that's it. So they're produced yeah. that way, so you have the number of tracks that do that. So I'm curious, because um, unfortunately I don't have a setup, I haven't heard these mixes, so this is the problem with these, is I can't just like in the afternoon say, let me check out all the Atmos mixes he's done so far. But what I'm <laughs> I'm curious about is how 
have you had a consistent approach about taking the stereo thing and spreading it, or have you found some tracks that you can completely break apart and other things that have to stick together as a vibe? Or like, how does the Atmos thing, especially because it's not, you're not cranking through Atmos on everybody. You're doing Elton's catalog, and that's a really cohesive thing, even though it's gigantic and spans every sort of genre you can imagine. But I just want to hear sort of your approach and how you work with Elton on that too. Well, it, it started when I first got the Yellow Brick Roadmasters. I, I had gone back and done a track from Made in England called Believe and kind of gotten it quasi 5-1. And I took it to London to play it for Elton's management, Derek McKillop at the time, and uh, he loved it. But Elton was, you know, he Elton's got the big picture. So he he calls me, he says, have the playback going. I said, it went great. And he said, well, just don't do Made in England yet. Go do Yellow Brick Road. You know, you know about that record. Just go, go do that one first. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that I should roll up. I literally get in a cab and I roll up to the tape library at Universal, which was in uh, Kilburn in West Hampstead at that point. And I'm like, um, Jane Hitchin ran the thing. And I said, uh, I need all the masters to Yellowbird Grove. And she's like, who, the, who are you? And I said, well, here's the deal. So anyway, I went through this whole funny process. Lucian calls me and he's like, what are you doing? And uh, there's a whole big thing. And, and, and we eventually just get him. And then we roll up to air because Andy Strange and I were going to do the transfers. And I remember standing in the lobby at air with Giles and George and Andy. And we're all scratching our heads going, this is amazing. we got the whole Yellow Brick Road album here. It's like 20 songs, you know, and how, what are we going to do? And George was like, what, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. We're just going to start and see what we do. So we did these transfers. And while we were doing the transfers, I started playing with the possibility of, you know, where we're at, where we're at. we put stuff in 5-1. Elton is always sort of here to me. You know, he's the star. He's the middle of the, you know, he he's here. His piano is kind of here. And then you begin to kind of branch out and you go, go well, rock music often works better when it's one force coming from one place like a fist, you know. So when you start to take that apart, it loses a lot of its urgency and, yeah. and power. So to take it apart, you have to be very careful about how you do it and careful that you kind of can work with the dynamic elements of the, the way the tracks are produced to, to almost allow them the ability to expand the track and contract the, spat, the track. And, and one of the tracks that works best that way is Rocket Man. And it worked great in 5.1 that way. But in Atmos, it's become, and it was a long, it took a long time to get people to listen to it because I did it six years ago and nobody heard it. And I kept saying, no, you got to hear pop music in Atmos. It's going to be the thing, you know? And eventually it got played for Ray Mia and for, you know, for the folks at Universal and Derek heard it. And, yeah. you know, it, it started to become this little movement and, and Dolby were like, oh, this will work, you know? And, because they, they, they were really, they didn't know how to get back in the music business. And now it's all Dolby Music. And if you look yeah. at the website, it's that most, which I was hoping would happen. But when you're mixing, when you're mixing in these multi-form, multi-channel formats, that is the thing you have to be careful about is when you break something apart that had tons of energy and power, or you try to make a spatial effect happen that really happened, but it, it was glued together in two speakers. Um, it, it's a real challenge. And I think um, I've had a couple of tries at it, so I'm getting better at it. But I can't say that, I mean, I, I don't think there's a formula. I, I have a quasi yeah. formula I use, but I don't think that you can actually say, okay, I do it this way every time it works. It's, right. it, you really have to be careful what you do. You have to make sure that you're, that you're optimizing it for a bunch of different playback mediums and also room sizes. Yeah. So, you know, capital is capital C is the flagship one in LA that you know, you know, UMG have, but they will have more soon because um, they're building studios in Santa Monica. But um, you know, that room is of one size. So, I mean, what is it? You know, eighteen feet long by fifteen feet wide, or something, or twenty feet long by fifteen feet. Wide. It's not very big. Um, but we took Rocket Man 
when I did it in Atmos, we took it to the Dolby Theater, which is 3,500 seats, and played it in an Atmos rig. They, they, they hung with trust. They hung the speakers. It was unbelievable. It was great. And so you, you, the, I think the key to it translating from an from a Amazon Echo Studio to a Sennheiser soundbar to a Sonos system up to a Klipsch upward firing to a Dyn Audio real Atmos room to a 3,500 seat room is divergence. If you can be careful with divergence, make sure you don't make it sound like a big mono recording, but you've got to have a little bit of everything in every speaker right. to me for it to work. Because if you get, you know, if Uncle Bob is back here, yeah. the vocal way up front, it changes the experience because what was intimate now becomes distant. And you don't, they, people don't think to move closer to the hotspot or whatever. So I try to make it so it's almost, the hotspot is a little wider. You know? And just to be super geeky about it, are you doing separate binaural mixes or are you just folding it down and letting that happen? No, we're doing, well, we have two different ways to work. So so just to zoom out for a minute. So on Elton stuff, I do, I do the Atmos mixes and I do uh, a binaural rendering that is a result of that mix. But I can slightly alter it for the binaural output right so there's some there's some toggles inside of the inside of the setup for yeah. the outputs that you can work with um you've probably done it before you, you a little you, bit you a little bit but yeah. well the renderer the renderer allows you to do a whole bunch of really cool tricks on top of just standard placement you know and panning and movement divisions between beds and objects that, you know you have another level of stuff that you can do with sort of a spatial thing Right, right, yeah, the the, the near there's, far. There's that, but but in the, in the case of like, so I'm mixing in Atmos and have been mixing in Atmos for about six years and really, really a lot for the last three and a half years, probably. Um, but I've also started mixing in 360 Reality Audio, which is a slightly different setup, right? It's a it's a different speaker placement and it's a different kind of beast in, ter in terms of how you approach it. And it's the, the tool called the architect that you render in is a slightly different, it's not at all like the Dolby thing. So it's two different mindsets. And their thing is described more as a head related transfer function thing where they met, you know, the, 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 when the Sony guys present it to you, you may have seen some of their demos. They mic your ears. You're like the Sennheiser head. Right. They through the speakers so they get they get a, a a pretty good measurement of your ear canal size you know how you how you respond to the tones and the sweeps and stuff and then they build for you a uh an, what they call an hrtf preset like for, it's your custom preset and it's probably a combination of of only you know maybe maybe there's 10 of the ear canal 10 of something else 10 of something else but from that you can derive your own preset so so though in answer to your question, the two systems have two different ways of delivery. And what my current task right now is to do is to figure out how to best optimize each one for each brand, you know, and we don't mix. I mean, I don't mix the titles like for Universal. In addition to all the Elton stuff, uh, Felix and I, my son, Felix and I, um, in our rooms in Ohio, I've mixed about we're getting close to 400 titles for you. Wow. Uh, and that's not including Elton. So we were well, like last year, we were doing everything from Nora Jones to Grand Funk to, you know, just. Wow. Felix did the Katy Perry stuff, did a wonderful job on the, on the Teenage Dream album. And we were doing, I did the weekend stuff. And so we were doing a lot of stuff. Um, some of it from stems and some of it from the multi-tracks. I preferred the multi-tracks. And in lots of cases where I had a better access to the multi-tracks uh, than the, the, the division who provide us with the, the, uh, the stems had, um, I would pull those in and we'd coordinate how all that worked. And then I'd work from the multi-tracks. Um, it takes more time, but it's, it's good. It, it works much better. Um, and for the Sony stuff, there's this flow of stuff that's starting to come from them, which is um, um, mostly Sony Music Entertainment product, but they also are, um, I think Warner are using so, uh, you know, the Sony system as well eventually. And they're also doing Atmos. So you have to be careful that you don't, you know, like I can't do anything from Universal in the Sony Music format because those are committed. There's just 
exclusive right. agreement in place. And then the artists, of course, have to, I'm sort of on the front end of it. So there are a lot of things that have to be approved before they're ever taken down the road, but it's virtually impossible. Like in my case, if I had gone to someone and said, hey guys, can I please do Rocket Man in this weird format called Atmos? They would have all gone, no, later, you know? It's yeah. not gonna happen. So I experimented with it and to a certain extent, I think Elton expects me to do that, to keep him abreast of what's going on. So um, you do it, you make it the best you can, you make sure you play it for the right people, and you get the approvals that you need so that it's not, you're not a rogue, <laughs> a rogue mixer, you know? But it's, it's, that's my current thing is doing that. I mean, that's taken a lot of time and that's what we do every day, so. Right. Well, it's great. It's great. I mean, because it, it, it's a weird sort of frontier. And the good thing is that there are people like you and Steve Genovic and people who are truly great engineers who are actually doing it. But yeah. it is in this very odd time of, oh, my God, it's a new format. And so everybody's just going nuts and wants as much content as possible. But, you know, yeah. how do you even get client approval? How does the artist even listen to it? You can't have them listen to it on Alexa and go, yeah, that's perfect. Like, it it's and I, I have a feeling a lot of the early stuff didn't even go through that sort of process it was just we'll bang out some content and there you go it's really problematic it's probably the one thing that is causing the most um challenge to the whole team and then it puts pressure on the individual people within the team you know like if i mix something and and i put it up the pipe you know and the guys at umg are you know, there's a variety of teams there that are working to kind of, you know, get it licensed, get it, you know, they're working with Amazon, they're working with Tidal, they're working. And so all these people are trying to kind of coordinate everything. And then you try to work in, you know, getting an artist in, it can get tense, you know, where on my end, maybe I'm saying, well, you know, hey, I put it up a few weeks ago, what's going on with it? You know, I'm, I'm honestly interested. That puts pressure on them. They're, they're like, I got, well, I, I'm not trying to get the approval, but, you know, he's on the road or, you know, we got COVID, you know, we can't do Right. We can't do it. So we devised this thing for COVID that's like a portable, um, you know, we can do, we can roll up with a portable system. It's not great. It's, it, it sounds consumer very nice. I don't want to say it's not great, but it's not like this. Right. You know, and I think the first time an artist hears mixes in Atmos, it's critical even if they're not their mixes, it's critical that they hear what the form can do in a studio that's truly meant to impress because it's phenomenal. I, yeah. I mean, it, it is transcendent. You know, I've seen people start crying for, you know, I've heard that song a thousand times and I never thought, you know, it's, it's amazing. Right. And so I've been kind of resistant to turn it into you know, it's like taking a, five, a beautiful five course meal and all the prep that goes into it and, you know, the, the, the acquisition of the beautiful food and the wine that goes with it and all that. And somebody's saying, now put it in a pill, you know, right. we would be like astronaut food. It's, I get it. I get that we need to get there eventually, but I'm not so fast to run to um, the fast food version of it. I would rather that people for a long time experience this transcendent beautiful big experience and when when you're working and i'm just gonna ask questions because i can because there's no one else here um the <laughs> <laughs> what i'm curious about though is is that you you'd prefer to work from the multi-track which as an engineer i completely get but at the same yeah. time especially with more recent productions the multi-track alone really doesn't have everything that's in the mix in terms of so much processing happens during the mix and things and do you find yourself trying to be as true as possible to the original mix and then just have the control to spread it out? Or at some points, do you just have to say, look, I cannot do exactly what was being done then. This is a different thing. Well, we've, okay. So the, you, that is an, a great question. And it's exactly the crux of what's going on right now. Um, I approached mixing rocket man which became the sort of have you heard this you got to hear this with i want to do that you know i'm sure it even influenced giles to do sergeant pepper um you know it it it's 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 an inspirational mix right that we did like i said almost six years ago so in doing that i was trying to maintain the original 
emotional feeling of the of the record not you know you're you're not suddenly it's not elton coming out of like you know that speaker up there yeah yeah of course you don't want to do anything that takes the listener out of the moment but what you definitely want to do is enhance the moment reverbs and things you know you can play with them and people really hear them and really feel them so I try to make it as close to the original recording if I'm doing something that's a that's a known classic recording and then try to make it better if I can. And that's a tall task. And especially if you're trying to feed a supply chain and you're looking at your watch every few minutes thinking I've got four hours to do this mix. You know, that that doesn't often work with me and I'm the first to admit that I fail the deadline occasionally because I, I just can't now if you're working from stems and i'll call out a couple of names like for example if you get any max martin track you got stems you got effects you got dry vocal you've got all this stuff i like putting a dry vocal in the center channel i'm one of those guys and i don't put much around it and it could be just because just because I don't know why. I mean, I just like it there. And the other thing is I think physically when you're, when you're breaking things apart like this and you have like drums and bass and a lot of stuff that's, that's, and you're trying to make that focal, that lead vocal focal point in the center, the physics of the speaker responding to the crap that's being put into it, it can't always be the best, but I find if I just put a vocal into it, it's like, it's, it's like, I don't even have to ride it. I just put it there and it's just incredibly clear. And then right. I can put a fact everywhere else, you know. And it's not being taxed. It's not. It's not throbbing to the kick drum or, but you know, whatever. At the same time that it's a sensitive vocal, you know. So I have my ways of doing stuff, and I break them. I do different stuff yeah, all the time. Yeah. But I try to make it. The current movement is like make it sound like the record. The artist and the producer and the management and everybody will love it because it sounds like the original record. But I don't want that holy i'll be the first to admit it i want the artists to hear it like they've never heard it before i want right. them to yes yeah, want it to pass their 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 sniff test by sounding oh this is nice got the got the piano in the right place you know wow the vocal reverb is great and then i want them to be completely totally moved by this new experience right and that's what i try to go for right so really taking it as an artistic endeavor not as a cranking out the atmos version maybe that's not the best thing for my long-term um well i don't know i mean i think but it's it's interesting because most you know they talk about it oh it's the new format so it's like well yeah it was on cd and you know or it was on eight track and vinyl and now we can sell it on cd and this is not that at all the way you're talking about it it is a totally different thing but the way it gets talked about is more we got another way to sell the back catalog. And I get that. And I'm not saying that that's an evil or a bad thing or whatever, but that's the sort of idea behind it in a way and why everybody's so excited. But it really, I'm actually very relieved to hear you talk about it that way because I don't, there's no way you can be true to a two speaker mix in 714 and have that translate to whatever crazy shit people have at home. And, and have it be the same thing. It's going to be something new. And so to treat and have it be the same thing, it's going to be something new. And so to treat it like something new is, first of all, it's honest, but it also means that you're going to be paying a hell of a lot more attention to it. You're not going to say, well, it sounds like the record, we're all good. It's You're going to make it work the way you would if you're making a record. And and I think for people who don't get it, I I use oops, I'm banging the mic. I'm so excited. I use these examples all the time, but the mono to the stereo versions of a lot of the Beatles songs, and I think that um, like Lady Madonna and and Doc Roberts are two of the most obvious examples of the mono and stereo versions being absolutely nothing alike. If you told yeah. me they were different recordings, I would believe you. Lady Madonna is a hip hop track in mono. Yeah, rolling piano, bass, and kick all in the middle, doing a thing, and in stereo, it's split apart. It's a honky tonk track. Right, it's totally different, and this yeah. is like that. It's a yeah. different thing. This so I love that you're actually treating it that way. So well, we have an opportunity here. We have a pretty elegant, you know, first with Atmos because it's it's embraced by more of the industry, and it is a thoroughly you know baked system. 
from beginning to end. Yeah. And then the Sony system. And then, you know, there are others. There's obviously Oro and there's DTSX. Um, but the two that I work within, I want the experience to be, especially if you're working with classic records, especially if, it's, if you're doing something like Rocket Man with Elton, or you're doing something that the world has heard and they have expectations. Um, I really want it to be next level. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I get into trouble. I get into a lot of trouble. And it's not because the evil empire want me to shove it up the sausage factory pipe. It's more that we have to get a lot of content out for it to work. Yeah. I get that. But there has to be, there has to be uh, at least a, f and I'm, I'm not trying to delineate me from other mixers because we're all trying, you know, Steve and I've worked together on stuff. Um, and I, I, I went down to Nashville and worked a lot with Colin at, at, at Berry Hill to get him up and Atmos mixing. He does a lot, you know, I've played back my Atmos mixes at Abbey Road tons. Um, I just think that you really have to be excellent at the end of the day no matter what you do, even if you're just given a set of super simple stems that are all mono and they're, and they're, it's a very basic record and there wasn't much to it in the first place. I try to make it, I mean, I don't fly things all over the place, but I try to make it really, really good. And the other thing, the other fault I think that I, I find, but you know, we, we talk to different people about different things is that because you have a million things that you can do with Atmos, people just want to do that. Right, and so you're watching the renderer, or you're 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 listening. You know, a lot of people want to see a lot of balls flying around. You know, I unfortunately, you know, disappoint people most of the time because <laughs> I don't do that. Well, but it's I, I I would much rather designate geographic zones to where I want the energy to go, and then I would like to move a few things, but I don't move a lot of things. They move themselves. Yeah, pop music moves itself. You you have things that you can. You know, there's a staging of occurrences that can happen that really um, can make it work. My, my biggest challenge with Atmos at first was there was no bus compression. And that freaked me out totally. Because so what are you doing about that? I'm just going to pick your... Create a Bob Clear Mountain mix. How am I going to do that? I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, well, I started using... We tried it by setting up a busing system that, you know, was a series of aux sends and returns that have... Each of them have you know, a single instantiation of it, you know, for the location that you want it to go to or a single instantiation across each channel of a bed track. I find that it's better to compress the bed track and then replicate that compression and key it from the bed on objects. If you can use something like the FabFilter L2, for example. Right. If you can get it to smack, you know. Um, some things come baked so you can get closer. Right. Um, you know, if it's a stem set that you get from somebody. Like I, I mentioned Max Martin just because those records sound like like they're made from stems almost. Like, you know, they, they when they get a part and a whole section of a song together, they stem it out with the compression and effects and everything on it. Right. Um, so, so it's hard. I mean, that's uh, to me, that's the thing. And that's the criticism that I hear across the board is, wow, it's really great, but it doesn't sound as powerful as the stereo mix or as loud as the stereo mix because it's all broken out. Well, if it's broken out and you, I understand the dynamic range that we now have within Atmos is, is something to take advantage of. We now have a new dynamic range, but there is a belief among some engineers that the dynamic range uh, is compressed or limited for radio or for some format. It's not often, it's, it's just fucking there because it fucking sounds good. And it makes you feel, yep. you know, yep. take a Chris, any Chris Thomas record and any, I mean, I'm sure that if you listen to, I mean, I know if you listen to Start Me Up by the Stones and you don't hear Clear Mountain's stereo bus on it, it doesn't sound the same. Yeah. It doesn't sound the same at all. So, so it, and it's not because he had to get it on wax or he had to get it somewhere. It's not that. No, it's, it's what it's sounded, that. look, uh, believe me, when I was a part of the Death Magnetic record, the Metallica thing that I won the loudness war, you know, 
but yeah. we weren't doing it for anything other than what came out of the speakers and what people wanted to hear and like that. Yeah. And that's every record you've ever worked on. I, I, I don't think I've ever been in a situation in the studio where someone said, yeah, that sounds great. Now do this because of this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the challenge is there and the challenge is also to, uh, like in Atmos, there's more comparisons. There's more things that you can refer to. You know, Steve has done an amazing amount of stuff. He's fast in the studio and he's done, he's the, the volume of things he's done is amazing. And the, the cross section of things he's done is amazing. From, yeah. From classical things to Robbie Williams to all these things. Um, jazz, big band things. Um, Nick Reeves, the same. Um, the guys at Abbey Road, the same. But, um, for formats that are just getting going, like for the Sony format, they played me some things that were that were done from Sony Music Entertainment, giving them some stems to work with. And there's this definite thing within companies where it's like, uh, okay, well, we don't want to give you the we don't want to give you the top line frontline artist because if it fucks up or annoys somebody, then we're all screwed, you know. Yeah. Well, whatever. And I'm like, no, give me the, give me, you know, no, what we need is we need your best thing and we're going to do it the best. And that's when you're going to get tracked. And then it's undeniable. So, yeah. So Sony had some stuff. I mean, I'm not telling tales out of school. So I'm friendly with um, Kygo's family in Bergen, Norway. Right. And, and I like Kygo a lot. I think he's great. And I, and a really interesting young, incredibly talented guy. And he's got great ideas about fashion and, headphones and where he wants to take his brand and they had asked me to to investigate putting his mixes in an immersive format so it was weird uh, it's like two weeks ago when the new kaigo album came out i've the family had given me these tracks to work with and so i did happy now which is one of his big singles in um 360 reality audio and i gave it back to sony and they didn't even know they had it right <laughs> It's not bad. It's not a bad thing. They just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, yeah. But, but it was the day his new album came out, so it was all eyes on Kygo. And when I handed them back, they're one of their biggest artists in their format. They just freaked out. They were just like, "Oh my god, this is the best thing ever!" You know, this is incredible. It's not that hard to figure out that you time things like that and you have a strategy about how you do this. Yeah. And and if you need an influencer, you get Elton to get in the bathtub first, and he's going to get you know, that guy in the bathtub. And you're never going to have to make that phone call to those 10 guys because everybody wants to do it like Elton. Does. Exactly, and exactly. So, you know, and, and, and that's being respectful to all artists because I mostly work for the artists. I mean, at the end of the day, as you do. Yeah. I mean, mostly want to make sure their, their thing is, is right. And I would say that in my tenure at Universal in the last three years, um, they're doing an exemplary job of right. being artists inclusive and and very uh, very cool good artists. great they've done a great job so we're coming up on well we're getting towards three hours so why don't we bring mark in and get some questions from the uh <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, no it's is it's awesome and there's stuff i haven't talked about we haven't talked about any of your musical projects with your wife we haven't talked about your label we haven't talked there's <laughs> there's stuff but i can feel my, my brain starts to melt and i know you know what I think we'll we'll follow up. We will follow yeah. up, but but let's bring Mark on and see uh, if unless everyone's gone, maybe it's just us. Maybe we haven't even been streaming this whole time, which is fine <laughs> with me. But I love you banned it. me from making that joke. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's it's like it, every week we're doing this, and I just keep thinking like, well, what if what if twenty minutes in the stream stopped and somehow Mark's internet went down and he couldn't tell me, <laughs> and I've just been talking to Greg, and I think that's okay. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> awesome. This has been amazing, guys. Thank you for all the stories and, and for the time, Greg. <laughs> this is great. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so we have some questions from the audience here. Uh, and we'll jump off with the first one here. Um, the first question is, what do you think the future of other immersive formats might be, like HOA or WFS? Wow. So if you can believe this, I know nothing about those other formats. I really don't know much about them. I don't um, know what the acronyms stand for either. <laughs> I've been hyper-focused on, on Atmos since its inception. And, and, you know, I'm aware of the other 
like I know Williford really well, who did, you know who conceived of the of the uh, of the uh, Oro three D system, but I don't I really don't know the other formats. Uh, it's been enough for my brain to deal with. I think though this is going to be a Sony versus Betamax, you know, VHS versus Betamax thing. It's going to be the brand that, first of all, can translate. And I think obviously Atmos does very well translating to headphones and it has to translate down, which all of them are object-based, so they do. And it's yeah. it's name recognition, whatever. Like they're all going to be amazing in their own ways and they're all going to have things that suck about them. Yeah. It's going to be, I think a, it's a business thing, not a technical thing. Well, you've said it exactly, and that's what is underneath, you know, right now, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And there's there's just that. And unfortunately, I hope that a lot of that is what makes the decisions about how we end up creating in formats, mm -hmm. um, if you know what I mean. It's a subtle yeah. thing. When you now, feel the pressure of, of you know, the, the one, one company wanting to have market gain over the other, you start to feel like, you know, oof, you know. So let me just ask a, a question, and this can be a really quick one, but now you've spent so, you spent longer than just about anybody doing surround mixes. Yeah. Does it influence your production at all, or do you produce a stereo record? That's a really good question. I probably, uh, I've, I've been experimenting with that with Felix lately, because Felix is also an artist, and he's in the middle of a new album. So we've been... He does it, but basically he's been trying to track this new album in immersive. So he's building the tracks, you know, right. in the form rather than recording on in stereo and then blowing it out. And it's rather compelling to hear. Like he did a thing that in order to get this rolling guitar thing, it was a it was numerous acoustic guitar overdubs that you would do. And it would just smack together in stereo and be really interesting and like a wall of sound. But when he when he recorded it, conceived of it and recorded it in Atmos, it's just unbelievable. So right. you can see that you would, you would want to use it as a production tool from, from the start, I think. Right. If you can, you know, Excellent. if you've got a way to do it. Um, for anybody who wants to get into Atmos, uh, say in their, you know, home studio or their other studio, like more developed studio, uh, what tips do you have for them? Um, it's point of entry is kind of a steep financial curve, um, yeah. depending on the speakers that you buy. Um, I would say the one important thing is don't go out and pair up a bunch of different speakers where you get different tone colors and stuff happening. Cause you'll get confused. It's got, it's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff under the hood. If you're working in Atmos, um, mm -hmm. you're going to monitor in Atmos there's a lot of filtering and there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on inside of Atmos that you're going to have to be slightly aware of. So if you have mixed speakers, it can be weird. Mm -hmm. You just never quite get there and you'll always be guessing. Uh, there are, there are brands that you could get like Genelec. I know have some really good entry point speakers. Um, JBL. To, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're still looking at, at 11 of them in a sub and a monitor controller. Yeah, exactly. And then how do you control the monitor? One tip is if you're going to use the Dolby production suite and you're going to use that as your place where it all gets sort of made into soup together, you know, smacked into a file, an ADM file that you output to, to Pro Tools or a, or a dot .atmos file. Um, you can control your master volume there. It's software control. Just make sure you don't have your speakers on full stun every time you turn your, your room on or you'll go deaf. Cause it's all, it's full whack all the time. So you got to turn it down in, in the renderer. And I use the renderer to control my room because I don't have, my system can only control a seven one system here. And then I, and then I done a, you know, buzz the speaker. So they're all balanced, but I control the, the, the overall, the, the top and the bottom hemispheres off of one volume. And also if you just want to mess with it, I don't remember what the demo period is, but you can get the Dolby software and actually do it in binaural on headphones yeah. and now that's an interesting thing too they they assigned a task to me a couple of years ago to mix tracks that i'd never mixed before in headphones in binaural and then put them in speakers and make notation about what happened and it was amazing what i came up with was it worked fine on the speakers when i pulled it out now that that that's also a that's also a workflow that people are advocating that you do now which worries me because if you don't 
if you don't take into consideration the impact of the big speakers, then you're going to be dealing with people who are more and more wanting to hear, you know, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a success unless it works in headphones. It's, it's, that's not necessarily true. You know, I don't want to stay in headphones with immersive. Right. That's my, right. Yeah. Part of the immersion is not having something on your head, you know, and just being in a space. Well, it's, it comes dangerously close to VR at that point. When you're strapped with something, you just, you, it just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, from the chat. Uh, I'm not sure which record he's referring to with this, but Lee Hudson asks, hi, Greg, is it true that they only had one microphone to record with in Jamaica? Yeah, <laughs> apparently it's true. So then the word back from the, the guy that was running the studio, Gus Dudgeon said, so where's the mics? And he said, uh, soon come, soon come, <laughs> the microphones. <laughs> so it's like, you know, and Gus is like, tomorrow, maybe, you know? And <laughs> they're like, Soon. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so that was that was like, oh my god. So that would be why that didn't work out. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, there there were there were a lot of guys with machine guns, and it was it was heavy. It was a heavy scene in Jamaica at the time, and Bob had to be under some sort of you know, or his assets had to be under some sort of guard. So, uh, you know, all the little you know this <laughs> little English band showing up and being you know like kind of timid it, they were just stuff not working and being in that environment right not not quite the resort of working at compass point or something exactly, exactly. precisely precisely awesome <laughs> okay uh lee also asks hi greg uh do you know what the synth makes were on the yellow brick road first track it's a big synth sound for the time best regards lee it was the arp 2600 and uh, Dave cut it, cut that opening piece on a 16 track piece of tape separate. Once they got back to England, he completely put it together. Um, first he put together a piano playing uh, a note that was sort of like a, like that he could follow for the, dun, 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 the opening thing. And then as it expanded out and got more rubato, the piano just holds chords and that's in the, uh, you know, it's like channel 16 on the tape. Mm. And then um, from there, they cut it on on the two track. They cut it onto the front of the 16 track and they lost the, they lost Dave's piece at the library. So I had funeral for a friend without the ARP intro on it forever. And then I finally found it and put it together. So it was hard to do. And I don't know how they did that crossfade. Gus did a lot of cool things where he would have like Benny and the Jets, you know, had no audience or ambience tracks on it. It was just cut straight ahead. And they didn't have that wonky delay that was going like a sound. Yeah. Like, Big stadium delay. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that was done in the mix. And of course the, the audience and the sort of like crescendo of applause and stuff is, is, you know, a, a two track capture machine running and then the multi-track and a two track playback machine running you know, and somebody riding that two track playback machine, playing an audience that Gus had from the Hendrix at the Isle of Wight or something. You know, that was what it was. Wow. So it's very hard to get it to lock up because you get these, you know, it's not exactly the same. I sat with it forever, forever and made it phase until I got it, um, but it was hard to do. <laughs> awesome. Okay, uh, Alejandro Alvarez asks, what's the hardest part in the production stage for you? Um, I guess, I don't know. I mean, in the production stage, I really like it when I'm producing. Um, it's exciting because you don't know what's gonna happen. So you're always, you always have, you know. I think the, I think the, 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 the downer can be, the business side of it, if, if something's not worked out and it gets, and it's, you know, and it gets bungled up when you're trying to really just concentrate on the great stuff, you know, mm -hmm. if a budget isn't approved and you're supposed to go in the studio tomorrow and then you know, that's the kind of stuff that's a downer for me, but otherwise the whole process is great. I've never, I, I, in my whole career, I have had very few um, negative instances happen that get, that involve me. 
I mean, there were, you know, very few things aimed at me and very few things. Uh, well, that ju I, just that one mic stand. Just that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just that. <laughs> and when Eddie, Eddie Reader and Mark Nevin went at it in that, on that record, that was something I couldn't control. That was their thing. And the only thing I could do is say, D don't worry, Eddie, we'll get this record made because she was freaked out that, that, you know, if, if the plug got pulled on that record, it would, it would derail her at that point. So anyway, but I think it's all good. You certainly have to be excited every time. I'm excited every time I go in the studio. I love it. I'm lucky. We're lucky. Very. Are you, uh, are you spending most of your time mixing these days? Yeah. Yeah. Most of my time is mixing. Or, or um, I was doing consulting for UMG where I was going around and kind of, um, you know, ev evangelating about Atmos and immersive and trying to get people interested in doing it or playing the mixes and telling them how to do it themselves. Or, mm -hmm. um, but most of the time now is mixing. And is, it looks like we're about to get into a period where, as you guys know, you, you sort of like, you know, the, the work opens up and you're like, it's a year later all of a sudden you go wow yeah. what just happened that's wild we're just about to go into one of those funnels of work you know which is it's good i can't wait really awesome okay well uh we have two more um and these will be pretty fast ones i think so uh first uh hi greg what's your favorite board that you've worked on for your whole career wow. that's a really hard one right yeah I mean, I've worked on boards that are, I had a Tascam 520, I think 520 that I loved. I love the EQ on it. Mm -hmm. And I've worked on, you know, great knee boards, focus right boards. I own an SSL AWS 900 because it's a tight little board that has nice inputs. And when I put something into it, I can make it sound hit bound pretty fast. And, you know, I like, I like this desk a lot. And you use it for Atmos as well? No. No. Okay. No, it, it, I wouldn't be able to control everything that I do. I don't even, uh, um, I've gotten in the habit of not doing, for example, I'll give you an example. Bruce Botnick, who is my dear friend, and only seconds away from me. And we, and who you're going to convince to come on this thing. <laughs> coming on. We cross pollinate a lot. Um, Bruce mixes with faders. You know, Bruce likes to sit at a board and mix with faders. So he mixes with faders. I find it slows me down. You know, I like to get everything kind of in balance where I want it. And then I'll do, I'll do rides and I'll just draw, you know, super fast. I'm not ashamed of saying that, but it's, it's just, it's faster for me. If I engage with another piece of gear, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I've gotten used to doing it another way. And in our second room, we have an uplift desk, a, black apple keyboard a black mouse and that's it that's the that's the control surface and you can stand up and mix or sit down and mix and that's that's our big variance and it's great it works it's like that's what you got yeah yeah well i saw um you showed us a, a picture of your desk earlier that was the standing desk thing and uh how is that affecting you when you raise it up and you know well we've got those position. uh can k and m or KNL stands uh oh, okay. i'm sorry m and k stands that you can you can control the 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 height on them so um so you bring them up with the desk yeah so like that's amazing here let's do this let's if you're looking at it really fast oop wrong one um if you're looking at this really quick you can see that uh i think this this one right no it's not that one sorry guys this one yeah so do you see that one? Yes. So you can see that these stands have a little throw so they can come up. These speakers can come up to here and it doesn't really change how you perceive the top speakers very much. So you can stand and then the uplift, the up, uh, oh, wow. and the channel will come up and these panels are just hanging. So they'll, they'll, they'll move out of the way if you lift them. So it, it works pretty good. The Sony system is rather curious in that it, um, it has uh, an LCR and then a top LCR, and then it has an LCR in front of you on the floor. And what we've done to, to kind of make that livable in our situation is we left our sub where it is, and we, we make the, the, the floor have a fan at the center. So we pan between right. left and right. 
but it is interesting how you can get this in the, in the Sony system, you can get this almost, you know, it feels like it's coming from under the floor thing, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the most important question of the day. <laughs> Whirly versus Rhodes. <laughs> oh man, I, I'll tell you in one second. Hold on. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it <laughs> but i have a worldly so yeah yeah nice awesome excellent well, yeah amazing that's that's all of our questions from the audience i love this from crowdcast yeah awesome thank you so much greg it's been yeah. just great to catch up too you know <laughs> yeah it's great <laughs> I love that we're awesome. unified in the world too. Well, I, actually, Mark, where are you? Uh, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Wow, this is yeah, true. Yeah, train model. Phoenix is based in New York, and then um, I work out of Columbus. Cool. Yeah. Well, Excellent. and half of Pure Mix is in Bordeaux, so that's good yes. too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then wow. some other ones spread all over, and yeah, we're mostly an online company, so yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I had fun. I hope I didn't take up too much time. No, no, man. It's Again. it's awesome. Really, it's really great. awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to a different graphic that says thanks, and then then we'll say <laughs> goodbye. Because look, I can do that because I got a button right here that says thanks for watching. <laughs> awesome. All right.